Great, thank you very much. Uh, my name's Alan Mix, and as co-chair of this study, I'd like to welcome everyone to the community workshop on of the National Academies Committee on the Future Directions for Southern Ocean and Antarctic Near Shore and Coastal Research. To start, I'd like to acknowledge that the National Academies is physically located on the traditional land of the Nekochtnik, Nekochtank, Akoston, and Piscataway peoples past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations and the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and the nations and this land. I would also like to review our expectations for conduct. Here at the academies, we'd, we're committed to fostering a professional, respectful, and uh, inclusive environment where all can participate fully in a harassment-free and discrimination-free atmosphere. We looked to each and every one of you to help us maintain a professional and cordial environment. Details on the Academy's policy on preventing discrimination, harassment, and bullying is available on the website. For a bit of background, the National Academies is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that is the nation's preeminent source of expert, evidence based, and objective advice on science, engineering, and health matters. The National Academies provides independent objective advice to inform policy with objective uh, scientific findings uh, that spark progress and innovation and confront challenging issues for the benefit of society. This committee has been formed to produce a consensus report based on our statement of task, which you can see here. <clears throat> Importantly, we are tasked to identify high priority near and long term science drivers for the Southern Ocean and Antarctic near shore coastal research. Based on previous reports and studies, uh, determine uh, the capabilities essential to support these science drivers and, and identify how NSF might address any gaps between the science drivers and the existing portfolio of capabilities. This slide uh, shows the committee membership. Um, if any uh, committee members want to stand up when I say your name, that would be great. Uh, we'd like to have everybody see who you are. Uh, first, uh, Paula Bontempi, uh, the co-chair of the study uh, from University of Rhode Island. Kim Bernard from Oregon State University. Ed Boyle from MIT. Dan Costa from UC Santa Cruz. Jamin Greenbaum from Scripps, Y.T. Lynn from uh, Woods Hole, Heather Lynch from Stony Brook, Barry Lyons from Ohio State, uh, Jill McCuckey from University of Tennessee, Ted Maxim from Woods Hole. I think Ted is online, is that correct? Um, yep. Uh, Wayson Shen from Stony Brook, and Andy Thompson from Caltech. Thank, thank you all. Uh, the agenda for today is shown here. Uh, the intent of the community workshop is to assist the committee in its information gathering by hearing from a broad subsection of the uh, Antarctic and Southern Ocean uh, research community. I think that meant cross section, <laughs> not subsection. Uh, this committee will examine the information and uh, material obtained during this and other public meetings in an effort to inform its work. Comments made by individuals, including members of the committee, should not be interpreted as positions of the committee or of the academies. In addition, committee members typically ask probing questions in these information gathering sessions that may not be indica indicative of their personal views. So please feel free to speak your mind and brainstorm. Um, <clears throat> we will begin the workshop by hearing from sponsors of this project, National Science Foundation. We will then have presentations from our invited experts. The first session will be on solid earth processes. The second will be on sea level. The third will be on emerging tools and technologies today. 
At 3 p.m. Eastern time, we will move into breakout rooms. Uh, these breakout rooms will be specific to each session and the participants will work together to identify the top research priorities uh, and necessary capabilities to complete the science. We will have both virtual and in-person breakout rooms uh, and hope that the experts here will be able to participate in those very important uh, sessions. Final note uh, about those sessions, we will be using Slido to take questions and comments from both the virtual and in-person audience. This approach has the benefit of saving time and equalizing in-person and virtual participation. You may uh, ask questions of the presenters in the Q&A tab and leave your comments about important science priorities in the ideas tab at any time during the session. Slido allows participants to upvote questions and it also uh, allows participants to rely on uh, a reply to or comment on questions. So while we may only have time to answer directly one or a few questions per speaker, uh, your questions may be answered by the presenter on or, or other experts. Uh, additionally, your questions and comments that we don't get to or will all of them will be saved for later consideration by the committee. Uh, so please scan the QR code from your phone uh, in person uh, or on online, slido.com, uh, on your computer, uh, and input the code that is listed up at the top, 3088868, and you'll get to our Slido page. Give just, just a second for people to mess with their phones, get, get that live. I see people uh, targeting the screen. Good. <laughs> it's like waiting for popcorn to pop, right? When the phones go down, then I'll continue. Okay, looks like people have pretty much got it. Uh, we will now hear from our study sponsors at the National Science Foundation. I'd like to welcome uh, Jim Ovalstad, uh, Director of the Office of Polar Programs. As of, what did you say? Two weeks, one week? One week, for one week. <laughs> so th thanks, Jim, for taking that on. Um, uh, we'll also hear from uh, Tim McGovern, uh, the Ocean Projects Manager from the Office of Polar Programs, uh, who will have a presentation for us, and Mike Jackson, Acting uh, Section Head, and uh, Tim and Mike are online. Um, I hope we've got that right. Uh, so thanks, uh, uh, Jim. Um, come on up. And uh, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Alan. Um, so I think, believe Tim is gonna show the slides from his remote location, so we'll see if that all works. Uh, so you're all probably looking at me and saying, well, this person has never been to an AGU meeting. How can he possibly be here? Um, so just, I'll give you a couple words about my background. Um, I've been at NSF since 2010. I'm an astronomer by trade. Uh, one of my recent jobs in NSF was as chief officer for research facilities in the office of the director. And I spent four years there. And in that capacity, I chaired a couple of internal NSF reviews and made the recommendations to the director for the Antarctic research vessel to be accepted into the design stage and then later to be advanced from the conceptual design phase to the preliminary design phase. So although I'm not an ocean scientist, I'm quite familiar with the uh, ideas that we talk about for the vessel. I'm looking forward to learning more from you folks over the next day. I'll be here part of the time and online part of the time, but I look forward to hearing more from you about the science, which is the area I need to be educated in. I mean, I don't really know how ships work either. I just know how telescopes work, but, but I'll, you know, I have, there are people at NSF who can teach me that. I do want to acknowledge a number of NSF uh, people in the room. I had a list of names. I was going to read them, 
except I discovered yesterday that I'm not actually connected to the printer in the new place yet. Um, so, so I will just acknowledge them globally, thank them for being here and their participation. Some of them will be uh, our key ocean science uh, experts who will be connecting most with the committee on the science aspects. Um, as Alan said, uh, I'm sharing this presentation with Mike Jackson and Tim McGovern. Uh, Mike is the Antarctic uh, acting Antarctic science section head. Mike will be talking a little bit about some of the, at a high level, some of the key science drivers that you'll hear more about later. Tim will be talking about the current uh, efforts that we have in design, what we're thinking about, where we are today. And then I'll come back and and give the thing that I always ask the director to do, which is tell people about the budget, which nobody ever wants to hear about, but that's my job, so I'll do it. Um, with that, I think I will step aside and turn it over to Mike, and hopefully we can get Mike's mic unmuted and go from there. So. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. all the committee members, especially. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks very much. Uh, hopefully, everybody can hear me. Um, so the message from the science community has been very clear. Acquiring the next generation icebreaking research vessel is essential for U.S. scientists to continue to maintain a strong global leadership role in the Southern Ocean region by having an enhanced technology and year-round access to the region. As evidence of shifts in the Earth climate grow, the role of Antarctica and the Southern Ocean in global impacts of climate change is becoming unequivocal. In the following slides, I wanna highlight three brief examples that illustrate the scientific drivers that have helped us frame the specific design that's being brought forward for this Antarctic research fossil. One of our largest scientific challenges is to gain a better understanding of the potential sea level rise we face uh, in a warming planet. As we all know, the issue is complex for sure, and gaining the insight can only come through direct observation of the ice, the ocean, and the uh, air interactions that are all occurring simultaneously. On the left image, you see um, winter and summer ice coverages around the Antarctic continent. And you can see that, they're, uh, that they can add, add, act as a barrier to getting in and making some of these observations. Um, we're showing the median extent of the ice coverage in orange. Superimposed on this picture are some of the larger glaciers on the continent, with the two dark red dots identifying the much talked about Pine Island and Thwaites glaciers. Having predictable access to regions like this of high glacial instability will be key to understanding the factors that control how fast and how much sea level ri could rise in the future. This past summer, our current research vessel, the Nathaniel B. Palmer, was hosting an international research team that had limited access to the high priority Thwaites glacier which is definitely a high, for, high profile target for studying glacial dynamics and sea level rise. The limited access was due uh, to the changing sea ice conditions in this critical area, and it kept the vessel from the near shore. Now around on the other side of the continent, the East Antarctic ice sheet, it contains an equivalent of about 19 meters of global sea level, roughly four times the at-risk marine-based ice of West Antarctica. However, relative to Antarctica, there is even greater uncertainty about the potential of the East Antarctic ice sheet to contribute to rapid sea level rise. The offshore environments of East Antarctica are ripe for understanding past, present, and future sea level. In the diagram on the right, we show that the ocean ice interactions are one of the primary driving forces of ice mass loss in Antarctica. This is a complex environment with fast moving ice that's influenced by snow accumulation, winds, a calving front, and the interaction in the interaction of the circumpolar deep water. To better understand this complex environment, we need a state-of-the-art vessel that allows us to determine nearshore bathymetry using seismology, gravimetry, and magnetics to determine the cross-shelf heat and freshwater exchange that will allow us to measure sea ice data, including remote sensing and direct measurements of melt rates from underneath the ice shelves, and the ability to core near and offshore sediments. We need a vessel that will allow us to explore the seabed, ocean conditions, and the nearshore ocean ice environment using sophisticated geophysical and chemical sampling instruments and autonomous vehicles above, at, and below the ocean surface. There's a saying in seismology, if you want to study earthquakes, you go to a place where there are earthquakes. If we want to study ocean ice interactions, we need a ship that can operate at close range at the ocean ice interface, that can break ice to get there and position itself for long observational periods 
as ice conditions change quickly due to the variable winds and currents. Next slide, please. Covering only 30% of the Earth's ocean, ocean surface, the Southern Ocean plays an outsized <clears throat> role in the global climate model. It's the meeting point of several ocean currents and an important connector between the atmosphere and the deep ocean <clears throat> for the transfer of heat and carbon. As scientists, we need the ability to obtain year-round direct measurements to clarify uncertainties about how the Southern Ocean is affecting the Earth's carbon budget. Right now, we know that rates differ by season and by ice coverage, but we have nowhere near the coverage needed to fully understand the magnitude of these changes in time and space. Collecting more ocean carbon data from regions and seasons, particularly in areas that have historically been undersampled, and then using those findings to improve ocean global models will be crucial for understanding the global carbon budget. Observations from floats, ocean profilers, and moorings and autonomous subsurface surface and above ocean vehicles will allow development of more robust and accurate ocean chemistry, thermal circulation, and climate models. These activities highlight the need for a year-round science platform uh, to operate in the Southern Ocean, particularly in ice-covered areas. During the Antarctic vessel design, year-round capability was identified as a key performance parameter of any new ship and a critical need if we want to meet our science goals. Year-round performance requires greater ice breaking capability, a modern hull design, modern navigation and positioning instrumentation. Collectively, these characteristics will allow us to work in rougher seas, near to shore, and in areas with greater ice covered areas. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, the Southern Ocean is rich in marine life, including commercially important fish species such as krill and toothfish, and the region also harbors unusual species with potentially great pharmaceutical benefits. Native Southern Ocean biota have adapted to the region's extreme conditions over many millions of years. And this unique biota is now challenged by rapid environmental change and the direct impacts of human activity. This slide shows the interrelationship between physical, chemical, and biological aspects that govern ecosystem structure and function. The relationship of organisms with their environment are enormously complex with many components to observe and measure. Along with other projects, our ships support a Western Antarctic Peninsula long-term ecological research program that has been running for over 30 years. This program provides internationally recognized baseline data documenting ecosystem changes. We are seeing direct evidence that organisms are vulnerable to changes in ice cover, the effects of ocean acidification from enhanced atmospheric carbon dioxide absorption, extraction of natural resources, and ocean temperature changes, all of which are altering species distribution and abundance. Ship-based year-round interdisciplinary science is essential to continue organismal and, uh, and system level integrated research to better protect and conserve Antarctic ecosystems and their biodiversity that impact the ocean function, productivity, and fisheries. There's a critical need for year-round observations, state-of-the-art instrumentation, and science capabilities with enhanced berthing and longer cruise times to support interdisciplinary teams studying ecosystem structure. In summary, these, these slides highlight that a new research vessel must be nimble, must be able to break through thicker ice and position itself near shore for longer periods of time. The ship needs to house and deploy state-of-the-art instrumentation and be able to operate year-round and for extended deployments. Such a ship, along with other U.S. fleet capabilities and the potential partnerships that we can explore with other countries, would allow us to continue to lead in Southern Ocean research. So I thank you very much for your attention, and I'd like to hand the presentation over to Tim McGovern to discuss the ship design capabilities. Thanks, Mike. Um, can everybody hear me? Thumbs up from anyone? <laughs> we can hear you. Oh, we, we can hear you. Great, thank you. Um, so most of you know, we've been operating our current ice breaking research vessel, the Nathaniel B. Palmer or NBP, uh, since it was delivered in 1992. Soon after its delivery, uh, the science community began discussing an NBP replacement vessel that was larger and more capable. For the next few years, various studies and reports were put out trying to capture the requirements of this new polar research vessel, or PRV, which was envisioned to regularly operate in both the Antarctic and the Arctic. Now, the MBP replacement effort ultimately led to the establishment of a PRV science mission requirements or SMR refresh committee uh, in 2010 and 11. 
A large workshop was held in February of 2011 that was attended by many researchers, as well as naval architects, designers, technical experts, ship drivers. Uh, and I know for a fact some of the members of this workshop participated. So the resulting report was delivered in February of 2012. The PRV, as specified in these refreshed science mission requirements, was for a roughly 390 foot long, almost 14,000 long ton Polar Class 3 vessel. So Polar Class, or PC, uh, is an international maritime designation indicating what polar conditions a ship can safely operate in. Internally at NSF, uh, a proposal for the vessel characteristics defined by the PRV science mission requirements was developed and ultimately submitted to the NSF director and the MRAFC board. Unfortunately, this proposal was denied for a few reasons. First, there was a Blue Ribbon panel study underway and the board wanted to wait until that report was delivered to determine whether the scientific demand for a ship of this size and capability was sufficient. The board also wanted the OPP team to further the analysis of alternatives or AOA, uh, specifically to look at leasing options. And third, while these two efforts continued, we also continued to look at the operational costs of a PRV-like vessel and came to the determination that it exceeded our combined MVP and LM Gould operational budgets. And I, I'm sure you all know, but the Gould is the our other research vessel that we operate. So we started over. We then further explored leasing vessels that were either like the MVP or had some PRV-like capabilities, such as uh, increased ice breaking or berthing capacity. Unfortunately, this also led us to a dead end. We found that leasing vessels not only exceeded the combined MVP and Gould operational budgets, but did so on the order of about 400% due to the need for commercial entities to recover the full construction costs of building new ships. Further putting the nail in that coffin was new Office of Management and Budget or OMB capital leasing requirements that would have required NSF to front fund the full 30 year lease costs prior to entering into a leasing contract. So that's around two and a half billion dollars that we would have had to start out with. So we reverted back to the MRFC approach. We tasked our OPP advisory committee to stand up an ad hoc subcommittee to review all the science mission requirements reports developed over the prior decade, reach out to the science community to validate those requirements and provide a refresh that we could use to develop a new MRAFC proposal. At NSF, we were very careful to moderate the size and capability of the proposed ship so that it would remain within our operational budget forecasts. This time, the resulting ARV was successfully allowed to enter into the MRFC process, uh, entering at the conceptual design phase. So that occurred in June of 2021. And by September of 21, 2021, um, due to the advanced readiness of the ARV design, we successfully conducted a conceptual design review. By December of 21, the NSF director approved our advancement to the preliminary design phase. And in January of last year, we started that new phase. And the ship has grown slightly, um, but we remain confident that we are still well within our anticipated operational budget. And later this month, uh, we're gonna be holding our preliminary design review. And if successful, we'll be advancing to the final design phase. So the current design of the ship is a significant enhancement over the MVP. So from all the science community reports on the desired capabilities of a new ice-breaking research vessel, there were three key elements uh, that Mike hinted at. Uh, and you know th those were the significant cost drivers. Um, and that's ice-breaking capability, endurance, and the number of science and technical personnel the ship can accommodate. So those have been identified as our three key performance parameters, which absolutely must be achieved. So at present, the ARV is roughly 20% longer, holds about 20% more researchers and technical staff. There's about 20% more lab space, a whopping 80% more deck space, 40% longer endurance, and a full 50% increase in ice breaking capacity. This new ship will be a massive increase in our overall science support capabilities. So 
Now, to give you all a better sense of for the structural capabilities of the new ship, this slide shows a side-by-side -side comparison of our existing capabilities, uh, the NVP, compared to those of the, the new ARV. So the image on the left, uh, these are ice conditions from July 1st of last year showing PC4 or 5 restrictions, which is comparable to the MVP's ice breaking capabilities. The light green areas uh, are regions of ice that the MVP could readily navigate through. The orange is more difficult but doable. Uh, and the areas in red indicate those regions where uh, a PC4 or 5 vessel like the MVP just can't get through. The image on the right was also taken from July 1st of last year, but shows a polar class three uh, accessible areas, which the ARV is being designed to. So there are no red regions, meaning the new ship will be able to access most regions, uh, even in the middle of winter. This includes the Pine Island and Thwaites Glacier regions, the Larsen Ice Shelf, and essentially the entire Eastern Antarctic. One of the things the ARV design team did was develop a design reference mission, uh, which helped the designer to fully understand all the different requirements and operating environments and tempos the ship would need to be to operate within. Now we looked at a few different scenarios, including the three regions uh, identified in the previous slide. So the Waddell uh, along the Larsen Ice Shelf, as well as East Antarctic. Uh, with a lot of input from NSF scientific and technical staff, members of our science advisory subcommittee, and through reaching out to members of the research community, we ultimately settled on a design reference mission based upon a historic 62-day MVP cruise to the Thwaites Glacier. But we expanded that to reflect the, th the three key performance parameters of the new ARV. So again, ice, independent ice breaking of four and a half feet of ice at uh, three knots, endurance of 90 days and birthing for at least 55 science and technical personnel. The mission was broken down by activity and categorized into average vessel operational modes, like you see in the table on the top left. From there, a uh, specific daily tasking was broken out to replicate what a complex multidisciplinary cruise like this would entail. An example of that is shown in the table on the bottom left. The mission included ROV and AUV work, CTD ops, gliders, multi-beam, deployed moorings and arrays, coring, net tows, trawls, aut autonomous surface vehicles, drones, ship aquaria, deck incubators, science workboat operations. Basically, if it was a pizza, it would be a deluxe. Um, so using this DRM, designers were able to then determine the exact sizing of fuel tanks necessary the anticipated ice breaking duration requirements, the use of dynamic positioning, and a whole host of data to be fed into the design to make sure that when constructed, this ship could actually accomplish a realistic complex mission like this. Now, just to give you all a general sense for the ARV's layout, the main deck uh, level of the ARV is almost entirely dedicated to lab space uh, or open deck working spaces. Starting at the stern on the left, we have our aft and starboard side working decks. Along the port side of the aft deck, we've got marine tech shops, a three van partially covered uh, lab van bay, then changing rooms and a, a dual entry staging bay. As you move forward, you enter the aquarium and wet labs and Baltic room on into the main dry lab and what we are calling our science operations center with a whole host of computers and racks and displays. Think of it as command central for all science operations. On the port side, we've got walk-in reefers and the hydro and biochemical analytical labs. And then continuing forward, you'd have your electronics uh, lab and ET shop, spaces for servers, and finally science stores in the bow. Other labs can be found on different decks higher up, including a meteorological lab, Marine Mammal Observation Deck, uh, UAV Hangar. So a presentation covering the full design and capabilities of the ARV would take several hours. So I will just uh, conclude the design overview by pointing you all to this website uh, where a lot more info and details on the ARV's capabilities can be found. 
So from a project perspective, we are uh, well into the preliminary design phase, which is the second of three design phases all NSF major facilities go through. And this slide shows our full 10-year high-level schedule for the ARV project. All NSF major facilities are required to pass through several stage gates or off-ramps before MRFC funding is awarded to start the actual construction stage of the project. During the design stage, there's the conceptual, preliminary, and final design reviews, which are the formal, formal hurdles that the project must pass through, with each followed by thorough internal NSF review and approval process, with the NSF director making the decision to proceed. Now, as mentioned, we've successfully completed the conceptual design review in September of 2021 and began preliminary design phase early January of last year. Our preliminary design review will start in less than two weeks uh, and is the next stage gate coupled with the director's approval to enter the final design phase and the National Science Board approval to include ARV project in the FY26 budget request. The MRFC funded construction stage consists of detailed design, construction, and then transition to operations phases. Transition operations would include outfitting and provisioning the ship, uh, crew training, science trials, ice trials. And then if all goes according to plan, we'll have final acceptance by NSF in early 2031 and start 40 years of service, which you'll note coincides with the MVP roughly reaching 40 years of age. So this is our plan. <clears throat> now, just a, a brief word about costs. Um, there are two elements that we look at when designing a ship. First are the construction costs. So what elements drive the cost of the ship? Certainly it's the size that plays a large role, but so do the number of personnel to be deployed and the endurance. So that drives how much fuel we need to be able to store, which drives how large the ship needs to be. Designing this ship to be a Polar Class three vessel means it needs to be double hulled. So figure roughly twice as much steel as a non-Polar Class ship, along with a myriad of other design elements to meet these stringent safety requirements. And unlike virtually all other foreign research icebreakers being built, we need to build the ARV in the US, which is simply more expensive. For you sharp-eyed folks out there, these are shots from an RCRV currently under construction. <clears throat> the other element we need to look at when designing the ship are the estimated annual operational costs. So these include crew costs as well as technical staff. Uh, unlike lease vessels, the NSF will need to cover the costs of all the major overhauls, dry docking, et cetera, which are required to be completed at set intervals by the U.S. Coast Guard and the American Bureau of Shipping. Fuel consumption for a vessel of this size will obviously be an enormous operational cost. And if I can just throw in some final thoughts before I pass it to Jim, um, USAP vessels account for roughly 20% of the annual U.S. Antarctic program budget, and these are rising. The PRV and the leased vessel approaches were ultimately abandoned due to the inability to afford to operate the vessel. And the current ARV design remains within our operational expectations. However, adding other significant design elements, such as a moon pool or full-size two helicopter deck and hangar, would drive the ship to be substantially larger than ARV, pushing the vessel back into the range where we just can't afford to operate it. Also, as I noted in the project schedule slide, we are on track to deliver the ARV around the time the MVP turns 40, which is roughly 10 years beyond the service life of most vessels. So there is a strong concern and risk that significant delays to the project could result in the USAP not having any ship at all to support science. So we really do need to stay on schedule. And with that, I will pass it back to Jim. Thank you. Thanks, come on up Jim and just remind everybody to get your questions into the Slido. Thanks, Tim. Uh, so, so Tim, Tim talked about the three key performance parameters. So I, I look at the three key performance parameters in trying to do a major project like this as being the science. What is the science we wanted to do? So that's a lot of what this group is about. Engineering, 
okay, what do you what do you need to build? How do you build it? Uh, how big does it need to be? You know, double hull things like that that Tim referred to. And the last leg of that is is the financial, which is okay, is something that delivers the science and engineering, you know, basically something that has to be made out of unobtainium, namely something that you just can't afford. Uh, so I think. I'm here to talk about the third leg of that. Mike talked about the first, Tim talked about the second. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the third. Uh, so this chart is actually a chart that was made by Linnea Avalone, who was my successor as chief officer for research facilities. So it's a budget chart of NSF's major facility construction projects going back to 2017. Um, what you see on the left, you know, I can just, I'm not gonna go through all the acronyms that you may know what, RCRV is regional class research vessels. AIMS is the Antarctic Infrastructure Modernization for Science, transitioning to Antarctic Infrastructure Recapitalization. So those are the projects that are now in construction in this major research equipment budget line. Off to the right is the ARV. We don't know the cost exactly, but Tim gave you the approximate schedule. So the cost gets refined as you go through these design stages. But if you look at this wedge here, it's of order 10 to the $9. So I, one significant figure. Um, well, it's probably a little better than one significant figure because we know it's one and not five and that one. Um, the line drawing that you see is actually the authorization for this account for the NSF in the Chips and Science Act, okay? Uh, you may know if you follow congressional budget uh, ledger domain that appropriations never make the authorization level. They're always underneath it. So the ship that Tim described that we're envisioning now is a budget challenge for us to construct in a few years and fit into this account. I'll also note that uh, there are other communities out there that want things constructed. They're not shown on this chart. Okay, there was an astronomy decadal survey that came out recently. They've got big ambitions. There's a next generation high performance computer that's in the design stage in NSF, kind of similarly in the design stage as the Antarctic research vessel. So this is the context we've got to operate in. Okay, looking at this authorization going up to 400 million and looking at a peak funding for ARV going up to perhaps 600 in the peak year, yeah, that, that will be a challenge for us to manage financially. Uh, so Tim, next slide, please. So this is, right, you're scientists, you like data. So I'm just showing data. This is what this account has looked like for the last 25, almost 25 years, going back to 2000. So it has typically been in the 200 to $300 million a year range for the last decade. It touched 400 at the time that we had stimulus funding, okay? You all may remember the complete financial meltdown back in 2008, and that was actually, there was a lot of government stimulus funding. Some of that went into construction. Some of that went into NSF construction. So the Sekuliak is you know, a research vessel that we typically use in the North that you may be familiar with there. But, 200, 300 a year. So getting to that 600 number as a peak will be a challenge for us because ARV is not gonna be the only thing in this budget line. That's not to say it's not doable. That's just to say that we need the science case that really justifies it. So that's what this group is about. You've gotta be able to really tell us how important the science is. And you've gotta tell us what the choices are and think about some hard choices because as Tim said, if you don't make, we, you, the community, the foundation don't make some hard choices, we run the risk of not being able to afford the vessel that we really need to replace the NVP. So that's just something to keep in mind in your discussions. Uh, next slide, Tim. So this is just a slide I made the other day. Um, this is the total project cost of all of the NSF major construction projects that have been completed between 2010 and of order of the middle of the next decade or the current decade. So the two that are scheduled for 2024 there, they're not finished yet. So this is our best current estimate of the cost. But you see an envelope there where the biggest construction projects we've done have been in the range of 500 to 600 million. And 
we're talking about a vessel here that's on the order of a billion. Say on the order of, because I don't know the final number. And you know, once you say a real number, then people start quoting it forever and you can never change it. So I'm just gonna give you the one significant figure number. Um, but again, this is not to say that a billion dollar vessel is undoable, but it's probably a good indicator that a $3 billion vessel is not doable. And so that's just, again, keeping this envelope in mind as you think about the science and priorities. So I'm gonna close just to come back to the task which Alan showed uh, earlier on. So next slide, Tim. Um, highest priority science drivers. Why do we need this? Why do we, can't, can't we live without a ship in Antarctica? Well, I don't think any of you think that, but why do we need it? We don't just need it because we want a ship. We need it to deliver science. We need it to deliver some of the things in much more detail than what Mike talked about earlier. Uh, next slide. Um, we've got science, okay, that you want. What are the capabilities that you have to have to support those science drivers? So for instance, Tim talked a lot about polar class three and where that can get you, where you can't get with polar class four and five. So do the science drivers really require that polar class three? Uh, we think there's a good case for it, but we've got to make sure that that case is made. Um, we've got to pre not pretend that this is the only ship that's in the sea, okay? We've got other vessels, we've got Sekuliak, we've got the RCRVs, there are vessels that belong to other agencies, okay? Um, Tim mentioned the helideck, I wasn't gonna mention it, but Tim did, so I will. Um, the Palmer has a helideck, it's been used three times in 30 years, for three vessel, three voyages. Um, Tim showed you the outline of sort of the ship. If you wanna have a helicopter deck, it's gotta be in the front. You've got to completely clear off the front for the helicopter. That means pushing all those labs, oops, sorry, pushing them, not bringing, pushing all of the labs sort of that Tim showed in the forward part back to the aft and building a big superstructure in the aft. Okay. And it also means you've got to have room for crew, which means you lose science berths because you've got crew for helicopter, you've got helicopter crew berths. So I just highlight that as one of the, one of the trade-offs, but you know, for the Palmer, if you're, as I said, we have three helicopter missions in 30 years. Well, if there's key science there, we need to think about, okay, are there other ways that we can do that that don't, and if you have to do it on this ship and it's gonna make this ship more expensive, that's a risk to being able to do the ship. Um, last slide. Um, a key thing here is if you think about the overall portfolio, not just the ARV, but the other vessels and capabilities that you think might exist, tell us about the gaps that none of them are covering because we need to understand how to cover those gaps if they're important. And it may not be that the way to cover those gaps is to load everything on the ARV, but it may be that we can do other things to help cover some of those gaps. But we can't do that unless we understand where the science community thinks the gaps really are. So that's a really important part of the charge for us is to help us with that. And I will stop there. I think we're done with the slides. All right, thanks. We've thanks got to, you know, 27 uh, seconds for questions. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. We'll, we'll take a few <laughs> questions. And so thanks to um, uh, Tim, Jim and Mike for that uh, very illuminating presentation. We do have a bunch of questions out there on the Slido. And uh, we aren't gonna have time for all of them, but we'll run over by a few minutes here so we can take a couple. So I'll just read them from, from the top down and we'll run out of time, but rest assured the committee will deal with all these questions uh, later and uh, with follow-up from NSF, I'm sure. Um, so the first one is from Aaron Pettit uh, online. Uh, did the discussions about the example missions based on real cruises include the aspects of science that were cut before the cruise left the dock. The example you showed to Amundsen C had science objectives cut because the capabilities of the ship couldn't handle everything that was proposed. And then there's a little amplifying comment. Uh, for example, uh, did 
did the discussions about the example missions uh, include aspects of science? Uh, oh, wait a minute, here it is. Sorry, I'm scrolling down. Uh, in particular, uh, helicopter-based ice penetrating radar was one science objective that was cut from that cruise. Tim, can you take that, please? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I'm just rereading it myself. I can't say that we we looked at uh, everything that was cut uh, in addition to everything that was planned for the cruise itself. We we looked at the the existing crews, and then extrapolated on that or built on that uh, for extending extending the research period uh, and the number of participants. Okay, uh, we, we can follow up with more on that later if needed. Um, uh, next question is from Kim Bernard. Uh, can you provide further detail on the oversight capabilities uh, of the ARV, please? So I think we're talking about uh, winch wire, A-frame, side A-frame, et cetera. Sure. Frame, um, whatever, launch. Yeah, anything. I will, I, I'm gonna probably get be a broken record on this just to keep us on track, but the future.usep.gov slash ARV site has a ton of information, uh, including all the different winches and overboarding uh, systems we intend to, uh, that are included in the design of the ship. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to quickly go down and, and say everything that's going to be on the ship. Yeah, sure. I mean, we, uh, well, there, there, there was a relevant question that didn't quite get to the top, but uh, in our, our briefings, we haven't, re we received the um, documentation of the ship, but there are a bunch of referenced reports on some of those detailed capabilities. Um, that we have not seen would be, is it possible to see those, are those public documents? Um, I think, uh, are you talking, so you, let's see, are you looking, I'm looking at Jill McCuckey's question about the project memoranda for Hilo, yeah, Jack, that, and Moonpool. Those are on the future.usep.gov site. Those are public. They are. Yep. So this is, this is all the references in the, uh, the report we've got in front of us. Yeah, so that everything's there. If not, we'll we'll ask. No problem. Uh, yep. Do we have time for maybe one one more? Uh, let's see. They've been shuffling. Um, the uh, uh, from Ted Scambos jump uh, jumped up further to Aaron's point. How would the ARV as proposed presently support the? Sorry, my screen is jumping as people are adding things. <laughs> it's a moving target here. Um, that one just disappeared. Well, I see Ted's question. I'm happy to answer it. Okay, you you got it in front of you. Yeah. So it's uh, um, okay. So if the, you want to read the question? You can see it. It just jumped to the top. It's a moving yes. target based on people's rankings, right? In the slide. Yeah, it's I just like didn't catch that. Okay. okay. Sort of like, so I'll just go ahead and read it. Further to Aaron's point, how would the ARV as proposed presently support the full intended mission? South Korean icebreaker was able to accomplish much more of its mission specifically because of helicopter operations. Aaron, the Korean ship, is also a polar class vessel. So yes, the Aaron has a helo deck and it had a helicopter. Uh, it also has uh, the same icebreaking capabilities as the MB Palmer. Uh, and therefore, it also could not get in front of the Thwaites Glacier. The ARV with its Polar Class 3 would be able to get through. And so instead of having just a couple of people on a helicopter be able to access the area, we'd be able to bring the entire ship there uh, in the full complement. So there's the trade-off. Oh, I apologize. Did you, you want to... Ask, ask my own here. question. Um, sure. Uh, until what point in the ARV development timeline can the science communities or this committee weigh in on science capabilities or needs? So the science community has and is continuing to, to weigh in on the design. The science advisory subcommittee that we stood up last year, early last year, which is composed of active researchers in the field, um, participate in interim design reviews, 
uh, on the project. They look at the design as it's evolving. They provide uh, feedback to the designers. Um, they reach out to their colleagues to get input that goes into the design of the ship. Those recommendations are submitted to NSF uh, and we pass those along to our designer uh, who incorporates a vast majority of them. So this is a, the science community is involved. Maybe not particular members of, not maybe not everybody on the phone or you know on this meeting, but your colleagues are involved. And the, the, the members of the Science Advisory Subcommittee, uh, all of their email addresses are on our ARV site. Go ahead, Jim, sorry. Jim, let me frame the question, which is, we've got a committee here, they're just starting. They're gonna produce a consensus report. You're designing a way. How do those work together? Yep. That's your question, exactly. right? <laughs> okay. And I don't know the timeline exactly, so I can't give you the answer to that right now. But... Yeah, I guess I'm looking for like, um, uh, so, you know, the, the explanation you gave, Tim, is acceptable. You know, if the pathway for the science community on this particular call is to go to the website and contact, you know, your subcommittee directly, that's important information. I think the follow-up is, is um, you know, you've got your your stages of design review is, is PDR, after PDR, is this over? You know, are you still entertaining a cost versus science capability trade studies? The design continues. So the 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 study that or the workshop report that this group produces uh, at the end of this calendar year um, will absolutely be fed into our our design. We will look at the recommendations. We will see what we can incorporate, um, and, and the gaps the gaps identified we will uh, try to address. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. So okay. even after preliminary design review. Yeah. Which, so I, final I design it review. In two weeks. Right. Yeah, but final design review isn't until 2025. So we are going to continue this design churn until then. But I'm going to take it that in um, things like the um, Hilo pad are off the table. You're, you've taken those completely off the table, even if this committee were to recommend that is the top thing. The uh, the moon pool is completely off the table. The Hilo deck. We are. We are confident that we can uh, modify our UAV, our drone deck, to support the landing of a single light helicopter. Uh, so it wouldn't be able to go in the hangar, probably wouldn't be able to refuel, but it could land uh, and participate in um, joint operations with another ship that did have full helicopter support. So for example, if we partnered with the British and the shave at Attenborough, we could help get that ship into deeper into the ice than it can. Uh, and it can help us by providing the, the augmented helo support. Thank you. Okay, great. I think we're gonna have to move on with the agenda. We're running a little late already, um, but thank you. And we will uh, save the rest of the questions and get to them through the committee. Uh, thanks for everybody. And it looks like the Slido process is working pretty well. Uh, all right, we'll move on to our session one. I'd like to welcome our moderator for this session, will be uh, Wei Sen Chen. Uh, speakers for session one, come on up uh, and sit at the table uh, to be ready to speak. So, some are online, however, in this one. Is that correct? Um, okay. Uh, yeah, there's room over here if you want it. Sure. Two minutes ahead of time, which is good. Uh, uh, <laughs> this session uh, will be focused on the uh, how solid earth. Uh, processes uh, would influence the high uh, southern latitudes. Uh, our first speaker uh, is Christine Sidaway. Christine is a professor and the chair of the geology and the Colorado College uh, in Colorado Springs. I think if we can start. Do we have sound? 
Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to uh, begin the session with an emphasis on crustal geology of Antarctica that immediately underlies the ice sheets. Let's see, I'm having, do I have control? I'm having trouble advancing. Or could you advance the slide, Miles? I'll begin with a slide showing the exposed bedrock geology of Antarctica upon the measured and modeled topography of the continent. The East Antarctic craton on the right is the old cold thick lithosphere. West Antarctica on the left represents a zone of crustal additions from convergent tectonics in the Phanerozoic. And these younger crustal materials are responsive and continue to be in a geodynamic state. The tectonic research for Antarctica falls into three broad categories of solid earth investigation. Next slide. Um, the structures and provinces with, could I have the next slide please? Um, within Antarctica are here shown with dark and light lines bounding geological provinces that have a shared origin and history. Um, a second category is the setting for neogene volcanism and faulting. Neogene volcanics in West Antarctica and at that boundary are shown in red. Um, in Antarctic bedrock geology within the context of the Gondwana supercontinent, a majority of which can only be discovered by geophysical remote sensing. Um, next slide, please. We can see that three, um, circled in the last side, there were three areas where province boundaries trend out to locations that the new research vessel may reach. Um, in the map on the lower left, let's just use the slow speed operation areas as some of the distant locations where tectonic sutures or boundaries tend off Antarctica across the continental shelves. The details in the continental shelves are very poorly known. Next slide. But those boundaries trend into neighboring land masses that were joined in Gondwana. Um, in this slide, let's start at the lower left and go around counterclockwise. Based on exposed geological relationships, the reconstruction of Gondwana continent is made by sparse rock exposures and rigid plate rotations. It may seem as though this is established science, but ongoing quite uh, innovative research is now using conformed aeromagnetic and satellite magnetic data to make refinements uh, and use detailed magnetic anomaly patterns that show nodes of strong magnetic intensity and correlative structures. For example, in um, frame A on the right, the Grinhogna craton ties to mineral rich Kalahari craton in Africa. In the lower right, strong magnetic highs and lows span from Lambert Graben area um, in Antarctica into India. And those are sites where we expect fault domains to um, bound distinct areas of physical properties of the type we see to tie solid earth to other disciplines represented at this workshop. Next slide. The data aid the interpretation and interdisciplinary work of understanding variations in subglacial geology and topography that are affecting and will influence the ice sheets. For the near shore setting, there's great potential for discovery and characterization of crustal structures, specifically faults that localize uh, glacial isostatic adjustment and are sites of anomalies and heat flow. ARV capabilities for magnetics, gravity, and seismics are critical to new discoveries. Next slide. Variations in the quantity of heat producing elements arise from variable, bed, variable bedrock of, of Antarctica. For example, irregular distributions of plutonic rocks that have high heat producing elements. Some of these are annotated in purple in the map on the right. Ocean access to new rock exposures, such as Stiff Island, shown in the photograph on this side, in a study of shelf sediments with iceberg grafted clasts is a future, future priority because the scale of contribution to GHF from bedrock may be great. Next slide. Um, here is 
a, a new multivariant empirical model that brings in four components to um, geothermal heat flux. Next slide. The bedrock contribution, uh, next slide, please. And I apologize if I'm experiencing a delay. Um, the bedrock contribution here from um, Redding et al's publication show that heat production in the orange box on the lower left can span a wide area, tens of kilometers or more, and is second only to volcanism in the heat contribution. In Antarctica, from what is known, some Jurassic um, granites have a remarkably high uranium content, as indicated in the uh, figure in the upper right, sufficient to influence the overlying ice sheet. Together with the heat production from bedrock units, another aspect of uh, solid earth processes that we seek to um, explore is crustal structures as fluid pathways, which I'll examine next. Next slide. Using sparse rock exposures in, um, in West Antarctica, we've determined that there is an existence of um, high angle strike slip faults with a steep configuration that affects fluid pathways. This is uh, supported by ever improving bed topography models that confirm the presence of strong topographic lineaments, a few of which I've annotated here. Um, one of the most prominent, one, prominent ones in this diagram is the Devit trough, which extends for over 500 kilometers. Um, the near shore regions are mantled by thick glacial sediments. So with geophysical remote sensing, we'll be able to identify locations where those structures extend across the shelf and have corresponding effects. Um, go forward um, two clicks, please, Miles. To the next slide. To the neotectonic component, lithospheric faults are a solid um, earth priority because deep penetrating structures can uh, accommodate changes in uh, be responsive and go into motion when there are changes in ice sheet and extent in thickness with reductions in vertical load that cause a crustal response. Fault reactivation or dilatant states may allow movement of fluids, geothermal heat or magmas upward. Next slide. Compartmentalization of hydrothermal fluids, including magmatically derived fluids, um, can um, cause even adiabatic upflow of fluids and heat to arise. Next slide. Those may effectively channel magmas as in this um, near shore example from Western Murray Birdland where a basaltic neck that contains ultramafic xenoliths from the lower crust um, have uh, been channeled along a fault. Um, the lavas are around 1.1 million years, which was a time of climate fluctuation in, of the Antarctic ice sheet. Detection of the features offshore by the new ARV will require some comprehensive geophysical survey capabilities. Next slide. Basaltic magmas of the type pictured in the last slide would be detected by magnetics, gravity, and would appear um, with characteristics imageable in marine seismics. So I would stress that for solid earth priorities, these capabilities for the vessel are crucial. Next slide. I'll conclude my presentation by showing recent advances brought about by geophysical characterization for a major part of the West Antarctic rift system that lies beneath Ross ice shelf. Um, what I'm showing on the left is um, the Ross the embayment portion of the West Antarctic Rift System, the Ross Sea shelf is deeply buried in glacial sediments. The strong trends we see are imparted by troughs formed by glacial erosion. The ice shelf and a marine cavity conceal the bed south of Ross Sea, so the bathymetry had been essentially unknown, as was the bed roughness. Locations of faults were known only for the Ross Sea from marine seismics. The Rosetta Airborne Survey um, with the, across the grid shown on the left figure collected new gravity 
and geophysics over the ice shelf. On the right, the gravity data were used by Tinto et al. to calculate the subshelf bathymetry and crustal structure, their significant bed roughness calculated and a lithospheric boundary not previously known was identified. Next slide. Carrying forward, uh, further work used the bathymetry and bed roughness, which range in depth from 200 meters in the white colors to 800 below sea level in deep blue to calculate the basement, or we could say the bedrock topography that you um, brought in airborne magnetic data. This model gets at um, the region below glacial erosion and sedimentation into the crustal structure. The basement highs and elongate troughs show clear characteristics of fault control, in particular beneath the Cypel Coast grounding zone where there are narrow, deep troughs that exceed depths of 4,000 meters. The physical characteristics show these to be um, sediment-filled basins. Next slide. Work by Gustafson et al. at the grounding zone along Cypel Coast show that these do contain uh, porous permeable sediments and groundwater and brine um, indicated um, with um, our interpretations of the locations of faults in map and cross-section view that are likely locations for conduits of geothermal fluids and circulation related to meteoric influx from subglacial melting. The numerous interpretations that arise from these discoveries made from geophysical investigations are of the type we anticipate for coastal regions, coastal regions that can be reached by the new ARV. So to summarize with my last slide, which is next, um, here are my points on solid earth considerations for high south latitudes. Uh, last, last slide, please. The fault zones may accommodate relative motion between adjacent blocks due to um, variations in ice sheet mass above the earth's crust provide pathways for magma and magmatic fluids impound basinal waters and groundwater and bound troughs that link marine and glacial settings. Thank you very much. And if there's time, I'm happy to take questions. Um, thank you, Christy. Uh, we perhaps have only one, uh, one question. And again, if you have any questions, please add them to the Slido. Uh, okay, uh, so we must move on. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Wei Shen. Thank you, everyone. Uh, our first five uh, five minute uh, flash talk uh, is by Doug Wings. Doug is uh, uh, Robert S. Brookings Professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Washington University in St. Louis. And one thing, Doug, um, if you click on your slides in the Zoom link, you can advance them. Once we get them to sleep. Yeah, can I have hello? Uh, can I have my first slide? Uh, go. Okay. So, um, imaging. I'm going to talk about imaging the Earth beneath Antarctica and surrounding shelves and oceans. Uh, and this is uh, extremely important for studying Earth processes uh, in the far south. Geology results from processes deep in the earth and the uh, geophysical imaging, seismic imaging helps us to resolve and understand many of the topics uh, addressed by Christine. Things like the source regions uh, of, volcano, of volcanoes and magma in the mantle, the estimation of heat flow, uh, for example. But uh, seismic imaging of the properties of the deep earth is also important for understanding ice sheet dynamics. Uh, and that is an aspect that I will highlight here today. Uh, in my talk. So on the left, um, you see that the, the uh, uh, a map of seismographs uh, across Antarctica, these were deployed by uh, myself. Uh, most of them were deployed by myself and my collaborators uh, over the last uh, 20 years or so. 
Um, but what you'll notice, of course, uh, especially coming to the middle figure, uh, is that uh, Antarctica, of course, is surrounded by oceans where we have no seismographs. Um, and so this really limits the imaging that we can do along the coastal and shelf regions uh, in the far southern oceans uh, uh, around Antarctica. But we do the best that we can. Uh, and so um, my student, uh, former student, Andrew Lloyd, uh, did a very nice imaging project where he used the earthquakes surrounding Antarctica uh, to, uh, uh, to, and in the paths uh, along those, from those earthquakes to the seismographs, uh, to uh, get an uh, image of the structure of the Earth beneath Antarctica down to about 800 uh, kilometers deep. Uh, he did this work on a supercomputer uh, using about 6 million CPU hours, uh, and the results uh, are shown on the right, some of the results. This is the shear velocity structure at 150 kilometers depth, um, and you see the, the blue colors uh, represent fast seismic velocities, uh, which are generally very cold, uh, upper mantle. So we see the East Antarctica is a, a craton uh, with very cold continental lithosphere beneath it. Um, <clears throat> but then uh, West Antarctica is very different. Uh, we see a lot of uh, red colors representing hot uh, upper mantle. Um, and uh, that's what I'm going to be, uh, be talking about here. Um, well, let's see. So one of the surprising things that we found in this study uh, is that West Antarctica uh, coastline uh, is uh, underlain by very slow seismic velocities in the mantle, indicating very hot uh, upper mantle conditions. Um, and we can understand this better as the cross section on the right, um, where we see that this hot upper mantle uh, pools uh, beneath the Amundsen Sea. Uh, in an area where we have uh, a lot of some anomalous topography uh, and volcanism, and then uh, upwells beneath uh, West Antarctica uh, near the Amundsen Sea Coast and Murray Birdland, uh, and there's indications of a plume beneath uh, beneath Mur Murray Birdland also. This is an area where we have uh, quite a bit of volcanism. I think Kurt Panter in the next talk will talk about some of that. Um, and so that's one of the effects uh, of this uh, hot upper mantle. Um, but the implications uh, of this Earth structure for ice sheet dynamics becomes a little clearer when we use the seismic structure to estimate mantle viscosity. The image on the left shows uh, mantle viscosity at 100 kilometers depth uh, that's estimated from the temperature anomalies that are determined from the seismic images, uh, as well as mantle, the rheology of mantle rocks. Um, and so this is an estimate based on the seismic structure, and it predicts uh, mantle viscosity in this area on the order of 10 to the 18th to 10 to the 19th uh, Pascal seconds. Um, and this implies that glacial isostatic adjustment, in other words, the uplift of the solid earth in uh, response to uh, the melting of the ice sheet, uh, should occur over a couple hundred years uh, rather than thousands of years, as was uh, you know, previously thought. Um, another data set that's relevant here uh, is um, actual measurements of uplift rates uh, from uh, geodetic uh, studies using GNSS receivers that we deployed as part of the PolNet project uh, led by Terry Wilson. And these are shown in here as these white arrows pointing up. And you'll see that this data set is dominated by just mass, uh, just huge uplift rates in the Amundsen Sea area. Uh, where we also know that there's a tremendous rate of ice mass loss. Uh, this, these uplift rates, something like 50 millimeters per year, uh, are the largest in the world. Um, and the only way we can get such a large uplift uh, from the glacial isostatic adjustment uh, is with very large uh, mantle uh, uh, or very high or low mantle viscosity and a very large uh, ice mass loss uh, in this area. And this rapid land uplift has important implications for the future of the ice sheet and sea level, uh, which will be more thoroughly discussed by Natalia Gomez uh, in the next uh, section. But just very, <clears throat> very briefly, the land uplift uh, may reduce the effect of the marine ice sheet instability, as shown here on this figure on the right. Basically, the idea is uh, previous uh, models uh, from 10 or more years ago assumed that the land was, was stationary. Uh, and didn't respond to the ice sheet. But now assuming that the land uplifts very rapidly in response to ice mass loss, then uh, this land uplift will reduce the effect 
of the marine ice sheet instability in which the uh, warmer ocean water uh, goes underneath the ice sheet uh, and, and enhances the melting and the destabilization of the, of the, uh, of the Antarctic ice sheet. So this is one of the effects uh, of this very rapid glacial isostatic adjustment um, and uh, more modeling efforts are needed to understand uh, the total implications of that. So I will close by uh, just mentioning uh, what uh, we might need for improved imaging of the coastal areas, uh, ocean bottom seismographs, such as this deployment uh, we did on the, on the LM Gould, uh, ship-supported helicopters to better instrument coastal regions that we currently cannot access, um, and in uh, se uh, seismic systems for imaging the shallower structure, uh, including things like uh, air gun arrays uh, and um, uh, and streamers. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, thank you, Doc. Uh, we will save the questions uh, uh, for the end of the flash talks. Uh, our next flash talk uh, is by uh, Kurt Panther. Uh, Kurt is a professor at the Bowling Green State University. Ah, thank you, thank you, Wyson. Get the first slide, please. Okay. okay, thanks. All right, so I've been charged to talk about some of the volcanism within um, Antarctica. So the volcanism is ranges from 50 million years, at least in the Cenozoic, to, to uh, present times, and includes um, active volcanism. So this is just, this slide highlights the eight volcanoes that are, that are considered to be active, including the southern uh, most active volcano, Mount Erebus. The volcanism here, as, as Christine and, and of course Tug were talking about, is related to the West, West Antarctic Rift System, so extension within that and possibly a mantle plume, as Doug was talking about, or Mari, Mari Birdland. On the Antarctic Peninsula, these are arc-related volcanism, including some active um, subduction occurring at the very tip of the Antarctic Peninsula, and then post-subduction and some very young volcanism that occurs due to a slab window. So those are kind of the origins for the for the volcanism. The, um, from a survey really of, of um, people, I was just in a meeting in New Zealand of volcanology and um, really looking at the community. These are kind of the main science uh, priorities that we're looking at is really understanding the heat flux and flow that is the contribution of, of magmatism. Um, the second one is really having a better understanding of explosive volcanism. And then, and then, as you're seeing in the third one, really understanding that feedback or the interplay of glaci glaciation with, with magmatism and volcanism. Press the slide. Maybe I'm not pointing it right. All right. So um, as Doug was talking about, a lot of uh, ge geothermal heat flow measurements have been made. These are mostly remote, remotely sensed um, through seismic Curie, Curie depths and so forth. And, and of course, the understanding the heat flow is very important to understanding the stability of, of the ice sheets, as well as the stability of, of ice shelves. Um, but most of this, this data is, um, is, is um, land-based, and there is some petrology, uh, volcanology relates to xenoliths that are brought to the Earth's surface, and we get um, thermometry from that. But there's been very few measurements made directly overall, and then very few um, within the seafloor itself. So what we want to try to be able to do is really couple making direct measurements, systematic uh, direct measurements on the seafloor that coincides with very careful mapping of the, of the seafloor, which is, of course, very important for regard to the, the research vessel for this. Um, the targets that we want to that we think are very important here, of course, the Southern Ross Sea, Southern Southwestern Ross Sea, where we have high concentration of volcanism. We have highly extended uh, lithosphere and crust, and um, of course, uh, magmatic activity, most of the volcanism less than 5 million years. Um, this is also um, in Edmondson and um, area coast, coastline. We also see volcanism in fairly young volcanism, less than, than 5 million years. So, um, let me go to the next slide. So, yeah. 
The other, um, so heat flow is very important and getting heat flow within, within from the seafloor is very important for that. Um, the next thing was uh, explosive volcanism. So we have thousands of, of layers of ash and crypto ash within, within ice cores. And these cores are from, from land-based ice and glacials. But we have very, very um, limited um, sampling within marine settings. So again, the capability of a, of a new vessel would be to capture records within, within the sedimentary records. So this is gonna allow us to understand better the distribution of er eruptions, the type of eruptions that are occurring, and of course the hazards that might be posed um, by, by eruptions. And one important aspect of the hazards is that we have several of these active volcanoes, volcanoes, Mount Rittman and Mount Melbourne that are in the direct uh, flight line of, of flights that come down from New Zealand and back and including commercial uh, airlines that are coming out of uh, Australia into, um, into Antarctica to do flybys of Mount Erebus and um, the McMurdo Sound region. So part of increase, increasing our record by getting more uh, marine sediment record that would be from shipboard um, recovery would be to understand this frequency, understand the hazards posed to these bases as well as flight lines and set up, um, develop a monitoring system for these for these volcanoes. Sir, could you please wrap up your yep. time? Whoops, went back. There we go. The last thing real quickly is just the third main priority was just uh, loading and unloading of ice on um, with regard to magmatic systems. And by loading of ice, we complete, we increase compressional stress. We trap magmas beneath the Earth's surface. Those are allowed to, to evolve. And then with release of ice or, or retreat of ice, we get vesiculation and pathways opening up in the crust, which allow magmas to the surface. This has been studied a lot in Iceland. We have long periods of volcanism. We have lots of glacial cycli cyclicity within Antarctica. So we need to understand these processes better in Antarctica. And, and again, shipboard aspects will be um, really important to these investigations. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, um, we will save the question uh, yep. uh, after the last flash talk. Uh, our next flash talk uh, is by Stephanie Bretchfeld. Stephanie is the acting vice provost for research at Montclair State University. Okay, thank you. Okay, so why is the geomagnetic field an essential science priority? This is already too far ahead, there we go. Okay, so the geomagnetic field is the surface expression of convection in the fluid outer core of the earth which is driven by heat transfer across the core mantle boundary and cooling and solidification of the solid inner core. Geomagnetic field observations and seismology are the only tools that are capable of yielding information about this inaccessible center of the earth. The geomagnetic field also has direct societal relevance. The magnetic field shields the earth from solar and cosmic radiation that would otherwise erode the atmosphere, which is hypothesized to have occurred on Mars after its dynamo shut down. And the geomagnetic polarity timescale provides foundational chronology for sedimentary records and for the oceanic crust. Okay, and so for all of those reasons, my community considers the geomagnetic field to be an essential priority. And our main focus is understanding the origin and the evolution of the geomagnetic field. That's a four dimensional problem that requires globally distributed records so that we can reconstruct the three-dimensional geometry of the magnetic field at time slices of interest. So for example, during the initial onset of the geodynamo, before, during, and after a geomagnetic field reversal, right, during an excursion, or during serpocrons. And the southern hemisphere and high southern latitudes in particular are a really prominent data gap. The figure on the left shows a compilation of full vector records of the La Champe geomagnetic excursion. An excursion is an aborted reversal. And 41,000 years ago should be well within the range of piston cores in the, in the ocean. Uh, but there's very few records in general and practically none at high southern latitudes. A full vector record means the core was oriented so that both inclination and declination are preserved. 
And that's necessary both as input into geomagnetic models and also for ground truthing the output of those models. The orange line and the blue line on the figure on the left is explained in the figure in the middle. Those are the latitudes where uh, a phenomenon called the tangent cylinder, and I'll explain that in a moment, intersect the core mantle boundary in orange and the Earth's surface in blue. The tangent cylinder, uh, shown in blue in the middle figure, is an imaginary solid that encases the inner core, coaxial with the rotation axis. And it's thought that the spin of the inner core inside the fluid outer core imparts an additional helical motion superimposed on the convection currents. And that leads to enhanced directional and intensity variations at high latitudes, but we have no records to test those ideas. Antarctica contains just a wealth of untapped data sets that can answer these questions across the entire geologic timescale. And that's shown on the far right. The blue histogram is a recently published compilation of zircon single crystal ages derived from the East Antarctic craton and the entire Archean is represented. We don't know when the inner core began to grow. It could be anywhere between 0.5 and 3.5 billion years ago, depending on what thermal model you use. Zircons that contain magnetite inclusions are excellent geomagnetic field recorders. And so Antarctica can potentially answer that question. The breakup of Gondwana produced volcanics, which are also excellent field recorders. Those span the Cretaceous long normal supercron, as well as numerous reversals up through time. And then of course, sedimentary records provide continuous magnetic field recording over the length of those records. There we go, ah, sorry. Okay, so uh, the needs for my community include increased ice breaking, so we can access sites of interest and accessing the tangent cylinder in particular means we need to get above 70 and 79 degrees latitude. We'd also like to see improvements in coring technology. Uh, for example, autonomous or remotely operated coring equipment that can be deployed underneath the Ross ice shelf and the Ronnie Filchner ice shelf, again, to access the tangent cylinder and also to access terrigenous rich sediments, which are better recorders than biosilicious sediment. We'd like to be able to penetrate through LGM diamond to get to the sediment underneath. And again, longer cores, oriented cores. And the bottom two figures are just a reminder to myself that underway geophysics and toad magnetometers should continue to be part of uh, underway geophysics. And we'd like to be able to deploy field teams for terrestrial sampling. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, we now have uh, a few minutes for questions uh, for the flash talks, uh, panelists. Uh, and we will read out those questions uh, that are coming in uh, from the Slido. Just a reminder, when you are adding questions to Slido, um, put them under the audience Q&A tab. There are also an ideas tab, but we will try to uh, move questions over from the ideas to the Q&A section. But a few questions for our flash talks. Um, the first one, um, Doug noted that OS OBS deployments would be better image it, in the subsurface coastal and offshore areas relative to the existing land-based seismometers. Can you provide some scale of what would be needed and how that would improve our understanding? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I've considered submitting such a proposal, but I haven't done it yet. Maybe I won't <laughs> uh, have time in my career. But um, anyhow, I, I would suggest something like 30 uh, ocean bottom broadband, uh, long period ocean bottom seismographs deployed for about two years uh, in the coastal regions off of uh, Marie Birdland and the Amundsen Sea embayment area would uh, greatly enhance our imaging uh, of that region. Uh, we couldn't really, with current technology, deploy them in the ice-covered areas, the areas that are ice-covered during the summer, but um, a, a deployment, you know, further offshore in the in the areas that have open ocean during the summer would would be uh, greatly uh, would greatly help the the imaging since there's no seismographs there for you know thousands of kilometers. Thank you, Doug. Um, another question for you. Um, are land-based seismometers limited in some areas by access? Would improved access to relative 
excuse me, oh, it just moved on me, <laughs> would improve access to remote areas by the ARV, change the approach to the distribution of land-based seismometers, um, specific infrastructure needs for this that effort. Yes, I mean, uh, one of our goals uh, in the Polnet project has been to reach and instrument these uh, coastal regions, but it, it turns out to be uh, logistically very difficult uh, using land-based logistics um, due to the you know distances and uh, poor weather conditions and rough environment. So uh, being able to reach these uh, locations uh, from the ship uh, would be would be great, and that would also benefit the the geodetic studies uh, that we're using uh, GPS receivers. Um, uh, you know, ideally, this would be with helicopters. Um, I don't know if other methods, such as the over the side, uh, you know, access to uh, ski dues uh, or something like that, uh, might be useful uh, or workable on a smaller scale. Um, uh, one idea is to deploy the uh, seismographs on ice shelves. Uh, we were very successful deploying ice, uh, seismographs across the Ross Ice Shelf and using them for deep earth imaging. Uh, and so that's kind of been proved to be a, a successful strategy. Uh, so I could envision uh, deploying seismographs on ice shelves, the smaller ice shelves uh, in West Antarctica, you know, from the ship. And uh, those uh, seismographs would be very useful also for some kinds of ice dynamic studies. Uh, as there's all sorts of interesting ice shelf uh, signals that uh, that can uh, give us uh, better insight into the mechanics uh, of the ice shelves. Thank you. A uh, question for Stephanie. Can you give a few more details about what you would gain scientifically from having access to land-based studies or surveys? Uh, let's see. All right, so uh, I guess I, I can't catalog them all, but in general, uh, there are members of my community who specialize in volcanic records of the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, volcanic records allow us to, again, give a, a full vector record with absolute intensity of the geomagnetic field, whereas sediments only give you the relative intensity of the geomagnetic field. And so those members of my community need access to particular areas around the coast where volcanics are exposed um, and where we can bring heavy equipment such as um, paleomag drills, uh, cooling water for the drills and be able to um, you know, pick up a large load of rocks and bring them back to the ship. Uh, some of the areas offhand are fairly easy to access, um, South Shetlands, James Ross Island. Um, but then uh, to harvest zircons, you can do that through terrestrial sites by sampling lateral moraines along ice streams. Uh, you can also do that um, by, again, penetrating a core into uh, diamond and recovering uh, sandy gravelly sediment that way. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, that marks uh, the end of the session one. Uh, we will now move directly to session two. Uh, session two will be moderated by the committee member, Jamie uh, Greenbaum. Uh, session two speakers, uh, please come to the stage uh, and sit down. Thank you. Thank you, Wayson, and all the speakers from session one. This second session is focused on the interaction between Antarctica and global sea level. Our first speaker is Natalia Gomez. Natalia is an associate professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at McGill University and a Canada Research Chair in Ice Sheet Sea Level Interactions.
Hey, thank you. Uh, so I've been tasked to discuss how Antarctica contributes to global sea level. And I'll begin by looking at why this is an imperative question to answer. Uh, this doesn't seem to be, oh, there we go. So global population is concentrated near the coastlines and nearly 10% of the global population currently live in low-lying coastal zones that are vulnerable to the effects of rising sea levels. And this population is going to increase in coming decades as sea level rise continues. The cost of sea level rise is substantial. Uh, for example, the cost of habitation along US coastlines alone is expected to exceed a trillion dollars by 2100. So as we've heard today, it is important to understand how fast and how much sea levels will rise along coastlines in the future. Uh, the polar ice sheets are going to be the major contributors to future sea level, and the Antarctic ice sheet in particular is considered uh, a bit of a wild card in making future sea level projections. Uh, sea level has been seen to be accelerating uh, in recent decades, and the recent IPCC report suggested that by 2100, global mean sea level rise will reach between about a half a meter to a meter, depending on the warming scenario. Uh, however, uh, this dashed red line here is um, suggesting that if under a high emissions scenario, uh, there could be processes in the Antarctic ice sheet uh, activated that could lead to substantially higher sea levels uh, nearing the end of the century and continuing uh, beyond that time frame. But even without this particular process included, uh, projections of the Antarctic ice sheet con contribution to sea level differ widely in the literature, for example, looking at the ISMIP-6 uh, predictions. It's important, especially when talking about ice sheets, to remember that what happens by 2100 is just the beginning of what um, is to come. So here we're looking out to 2300 when we're seeing that the ice sheet contribute uh, several meters or more to sea level and we're really seeing the distinction between high and low end emission scenarios here as well. The sea level experienced along a particular coastal site can differ substantially from the global mean sea level values that we see so often discussed in the literature. And this is due to Earth gravitational, uh, rotational, and deformational effects. So for example, for West Antarctic ice loss, uh, sea level will actually fall substantially near the West Antarctic ice sheet and then rise by progressively more at greater distances. Uh, and the peak sea level rise for West Antarctic ice loss occurs around North American coastlines and in the Indian Ocean. But this pattern of sea level change globally is dependent on the location of ice loss. And so we need to know not only how much ice is going to melt in Antarctica, but also where along the periphery of the ice sheet it's going to come from. Uh, recent work has also looked at the rapidly uplifting uh, solid earth beneath marine basins uh, can expel water out of Antarctica and increase sea level rise in the far field. And we've also, um, this is a, a, an example of a review paper looking at the inequitable impacts of sea level rise. So it's important to notice that the areas such as coastal, um, such as island nations are experiencing the worst impacts of sea level rise now and will continue to experience greater than average sea level rise uh, going forward. So sea level rise uh, does recede shorelines and lead to land loss and areas permanently underwater but it also increases the reach of storm surges and the impact and frequency of uh, tidal or sunny day flooding events. So here is an example of um, that we're already seeing this happening along uh, the US coastline. So here is a prediction of the number of days per year. Uh, back in the 1950s, we had a few days per year um, at these sites of flood events. And going forward to 2015, we're seeing more like tens of days per year. And this is going to continue with continued sea level rise in future. So here's an example of projections from uh, Charleston, South Carolina and San Francisco, where we may see nearly daily flooding in these areas by the end of the century. So now we can turn to uh, why is it so difficult to predict what the contribution from the Antarctic ice sheet will be. So here is a summary of the processes and uh, currently available observations in Antarctica. And the Antarctic ice sheet is difficult to predict because it interacts 
strongly with the surrounding ocean, solid earth, and atmosphere, and processes and feedbacks are operating on a range of different spatiotemporal scales. Um, most of the uh, key observables, which are taking place around the periphery of the ice sheet, where these uh, systems interact, um, are often buried under either grounded ice or beneath floating ice shelves. So for example, we need to know the ocean circulation beneath an ice shelf to know how much the ice shelf is going to melt. We are particularly concerned about marine sectors of ice. So these are areas where the ice sits on top of bedrock that's below sea level. These areas gain mass through accumulation snowfall from above and flow outwards, losing most of their mass through flux across the grounding line into floating ice shelves. And the loss of ice across the grounding line increases as the edge of the ice retreats into deeper water, leading to a runaway ice sheet retreat event. Uh, more recently, there's also been a marine ice cliff instability proposed that leads to these really high end projections that I showed earlier. And in this case, if we break up the ice shelf um, through surface melting, then we're left with an unstable cliff at the grounding line, which will retreat across the uh, marine basin. And in both of these cases, we really need a detailed understanding of the elevation and conditions at the at the bed near the grounding line uh, in order to better simulate these processes. Here I'm showing recent ice loss from the Antarctic ice sheet over the last uh, two decades, both from Gray's gravity data and altimetry with um, GPS uplift rates in the pink arrows in response to uh, the ice loss. So what we see is that the ice loss sort of hot spots are concentrated around the coastline. And also in particular in the altimetry data, we see that conditions are varying um, around the periphery of the ice sheet. So we need to better sample these areas, especially ones that are going to be current and future um, hotspots of ice loss. But these are often difficult to access um, and maybe not near, uh, not near land-based uh, base camps. And so accessing through the ocean could improve our records here. Uh, paleo records are also important uh, for understanding the behavior of the Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, first, longer term records provide a context for the recent changes that we're seeing. And in addition, um, paleo constraints can show that uh, show evidence of large scale retreat events during past warm periods, uh, which we have not seen yet in the instrumental record. Uh, here on the left, I'm highlighting a recent uh, review paper that's showing a compilation of data that gives us a better understanding of, um, of the Holocene and bridges the record, the instrumental record with the geologic record. And we also need to bridge uh, these timescales in modeling efforts. Uh, these kinds of paleo records are really important and useful for modeling efforts. Uh, so as an example, on the left, I'm showing um, a study where we incorporated ice rafted debris records, grounding line, uh, sea level and exposure data to gain a better understanding of the processes driving Antarctica during the last deglaciation. And on the right is a study where we applied paleo sea level constraints during past uh, warm periods, here in particular, we're highlighting the last interglacial. Uh, to constrain the parameters, the range of parameters possible for future projections. Uh, glacial isostatic adjustment predictions also rely on ice history as well as earth structure as inputs, um, where earth structure is typically uh, derived from seismic tomography, as we saw earlier, and um, GPS inferences of the structure, the viscosity structure. And due to uncertainties in these two inputs, we can see on the right that uh, predictions of GIA associated uplift of the earth uh, at present uh, differ widely in the literature. And this has implications for interpretations of records such as GRACE data. And as we heard from Doug earlier, we also have areas of very low viscosity in, in that coincide with areas of active ice loss in the West Antarctic. So here as an example is a prediction of sea level change over the instrumental record and into the future, adopting a range of different earth models. And we see the viscous effects are coming into play on the timescales of melting from recent 
uh, instrumental record ice loss, as well as going to continue to lead to further sea level fall at the edge of the ice sheet in future. And this can feed back into the dynamics of the ice sheet there. So in summary, it is imperative to improve Antarctic ice sheet projections given the cost and impact of ongoing and future sea level rise. Uh, and a scaled up investment in ice sheet research is really needed to achieve this. Ice loss, key processes and feedbacks that need to be observed are concentrated in a band around the periphery of the ice sheet and the surrounding ocean. And we've seen that input from and collaboration across a wide range of fields is needed. Uh, and so resources such as icebreakers really need to be leveraged to be able to serve multiple fields at once. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. We now have three minutes for questions, which we'll read out from Slido. What aspect of this research must, must be accomplished in the next 20 years before 2050? And how will this answer be different in 20 years from now? So after 2050. Oh, well, that's a big question. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that it's uh, important, especially to sample where we're seeing the most action now. So really near the periphery in these hot spots of ice loss. Um, this will be able to better provide better constraints on um, on ice processes and and sort of narrow the range of projections from the Antarctic ice sheet contributing to sea level. Um, that was a, a sort of broad answer for a broad question, but I'm sure that we're going to hear a lot more from the other speakers as well on this. That was the only question in Slido. So if anyone has a question they're entering, um, I'll give you a minute to enter it now, otherwise we'll move on. I could sort of add to that, that um, being able to understand uh, both modern, you know, uh, modern observations of what's happened recently or now and ongoing are important, but it's if we're, we're headed into a zone that we haven't seen yet with the instrumental record. So it's also important to be able to get at paleo records in these areas, which are also difficult to access because they're buried under, under ice. So, um, for example, a past grounding line record. Uh, in the Ross Sea really helped us to be able to uh, constrain what was driving retreat in that area um, over the last deglaciation, which in turn can improve our um, predictions of glacial isostatic adjustment, for example. Um, I'll, I'll type this in the Slido after I ask it, if that's okay. Um, so I appreciated in your talk how you used a number of observational tools and capabilities from in situ to satellite, and then also um, touched on modeling capabilities and infrastructure that you need to do the work that you just talked about. I wonder in the context of this panel's statement of task, if you could attempt any sort of prioritization as to where you see some of the drivers of um, observational capability or modeling capability and needs. Yeah, so I think we're we're about to hear more about this in the in the talks, but um, in particular, understanding of sort of the conditions and elevation of the bed in these areas, both at the location of currently retreating grounding line and uh, future grounding lines is going to be important. It's not just sort of the big picture of what the bed slope looks like, but also the detailed structure, uh, whether there are bumps that the grounding line could get stuck on. That's one of the areas that I think is really important that we might hear more about. Um, and also understanding the, the sort of fate of the ice shelves and how they're being melted from, from below and maybe also from above um, is, yeah, and I think we'll just sort of continue to to identify those as uh, the, the rest of the session. All right, thank you again, Natalia. Our first five minute flash talk is by Ted Scambos. Ted is a senior research scientist at the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences at the University of Colorado. Yeah. Uh, Thanks very much. Um, thanks to the National Academy and also to the funding agencies that have supported research that I've been involved with and with a lot of colleagues. I only have five minutes. I think maybe the best way to summarize my talk is 
what she said, because <laughs> uh, you're going to see quite a few of the same slides, but let's run through them quickly and see if it helps um, with me saying some words alongside of them. First of all, you already saw this slide about the forecasted sea level rise and the fact that flying above all of the predicted sea level rise rates due to the three processes, thermal expansion, ice sheets, um, uh, glaciers, uh, that those um, have an additional possibility uh, coming from the ice sheets and in particular from Antarctica uh, and these um, marine-based uh, large glaciers. I also wanted to point out that there is a past record of sea level rise at rates that would astonish us today up to as much as two to four meters per century. So these forecasts for the end of the century reaching as much as 30 millimeters per year are not unprecedented in the, um, in the geologic record. <laughs> what areas are losing ice? Um, clearly these red areas that have lost elevation over the past 20 years are areas that are losing ice. They're all along the coast of Antarctica, but they're importantly along both the East Coast and the West Coast, or excuse me, East Antarctic Coast and West Antarctic Coast. Um, the main driving um, mechanism for the mass loss that's going on is thought to be this marine ice cliff instability, which may have gotten underway to the point where um, it's irreversible and that we'll eventually see the West Antarctic ice sheet um, disappear. However, um, it's clear from several studies recently that a lot of the pace of that retreat and eventual um, loss of the West Antarctic ice sheet is um, within our control if we uh, stop forcing the Earth system in ways that lead to warm water reaching the coastline of Antarctica, which I'll show in a second. Um, all of these regions, oh, the red dots, are areas that are uh, bounded by, <clears throat> excuse me, that have a deep marine area behind them and are likely to retreat rapidly. And as you can see from this, uh, map of the elevation of the bedrock of Antarctica, there's large blue areas, meaning below sea level behind many of these large glaciers. All of these are likely areas that will inform us about the future of sea level rise from Antarctica. Um, main reason or the main mechanism for delivering this warm water, which is at depth, not on the surface in Antarctica, is um, basically wind shear from westerlies and easterlies acting over the continental shelf break. This raises the ice of Picknells um, across that shelf break and allows circumpolar deep water, which was always there. It is warming slowly, but it um, is now allowed to reach the edge of the ice sheet more frequently than it used to because of changes in the wind pattern. Those changes in the wind pattern are directly tied to the effects of greenhouse gas forcing and in particular the effects on the Central Pacific. So components of a warm deep outlet system, we're not gonna go through all of these. It's complex, it reaches across many, many disciplines. This is the kind of area that we wanna to get to with the new icebreaker and explore it in a variety of ways, installing instruments both on the ice and uh, on the ocean floor underneath the ice shelf. Um, and, also, um, and access is gonna be the most important thing, obviously, that the ARV can do for the science community. Well, this is what the area looks like. And I'm telling you that not even a uh, polar class three is really going to be able to get into this kind of area. And yet there are key places on this kind of a surface. And this is typical of the red areas that I showed in the earlier map, the red dots, of where we would want to go and what we would want to learn from being in these areas. Uh, in addition to these point places that we might want to visit for CTD casts, for ice shelf cavity moorings, for drilling to deploy sensors at the grounding line, we're interested in flying high resolution aerogeophysics. Eric Pettit mentioned that in one of her questions. We're also interested in tagging seals in areas that aren't immediately by a coastline or someplace that's accessible to the um, ship. The seals can get in there and pinning point surveys, landing on these isolated high spots in the ocean that actually do a lot to suppress the acceleration of uh, some of these outlet glaciers. <clears throat> this is the most recent map for the um, um, uh, ice mass balance in a comparison experiment, MB. And you, what you can see here is that the ice sheets are contributing greatly to sea level rise. But the future is, um, quite a bit more uh, extreme. And we can expect that we're gonna see this continue and that um, uh, 
and that the exploration that will be conducted for the next 40 years, for the next two or three generations of scientists by this ARV, will be the ones that are addressing the issues that come up during that period of uh, rapid ice loss. And uh, I'll take any questions uh, after the other talks. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Our next flash talk is by Adrian Jenkins. Adrian is a professor of ocean science at Northumbria University. I think he'll be joining us on Zoom. Uh, yes, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Yep. Okay. Um, well, first of all, um, uh, good morning to you all. Um, and thank you to the, the National Science, uh, to the NSF and the committee and the National Academy for giving me the opportunity to address the meeting and for joining remotely. Um, so my task is to, to spend five minutes just talking about the importance of the interaction between the ice shelves and the oceans and how we, um, how we might set about observing them. Um, do I have control of the slides? Yeah, was that me? Okay, there's delay, I'm sorry, I might have... So this map of Antarctica is kind of, it's, it's similar to what you've seen before. It shows um, actually in cyan, it shows the thinning and the lowering of the surface. Um, so particularly in West Antarctica, those blobs of cyan over Pine Island and Thwaites glaciers in the Amazon Sea sector, that's the primary contribution of Antarctica to sea level. So that's what we're trying to understand. Um, so the main driver is coming at the moment, it's coming from the ocean. Um, you can see there in the ocean, plotted in the ocean in the colours, there is the, um, is the temperature of the ocean average between 200 metres and, uh, and basically 1,000 metres or the seabed. So that's actually the the level of the layer of the ocean that can access the region beneath the ice shelves, which are shown there, the floating parts of the ice sheet, which are shown there in, in grey. So you can see a distinctive pattern there in that uh, around most of Antarctica, those shelf waters are cold. So the, the edge of the continental shelf is shown by the, um, the solid black line. Um, and the reason we've got warm, effectively a warm situation off shelf, and then um, is this like an advance? Yeah, there we go. Okay, that's gone too far. Apologize. Okay, so essentially the, there's warm water all around Antarctica known as circumpolar deep water. That's that red that you can see there. Um, if you look below the surface, then then you see just that warm that that warm water. There's a cold layer on the surface everywhere in the Southern Ocean, and that thickens over the continental shelf. So essentially, the reason those continental shelf regions are cold is because of the deepening of that surface layer. Um, and that essentially shields many of the ice shelves around Antarctica. So wherever circumpolar deep water can get on the shelf, um, it's kind of at the seabed. Um, now, in certain areas around Antarctica, um, where there's particularly uh, the Weddell Sea and the Ross Sea are the ones that, that really um, uh, are prime examples of this, of other, other areas, but where the sea ice production is particularly strong, then what forms is a, is a water mass that's, that's denser. So it's the same kind of temperature as near the freezing point, but it's denser than circumpolar deep water. And that has two important impacts. So one is if that means if the circumpolar deep water can access the shelf, it rides above this, this dense water. And so can, it essentially it's access to the cavity, the cavity beneath the ice shelves is largely blocked. Um, it also means that where waters leave the shelf, then they're dense enough to sink. And that's the source of the Antarctic bottom water, which contributes to the, the lower limb of the global measuring and long-term circulation. So these processes on the shelf are absolutely key to determining um, ocean, the global ocean circulation and the mass balance of the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, now, the regions that are particularly warm and are particularly worrying at the moment are ones where actually that surface layer doesn't thicken enough uh, to block the warm water. So the warm water is there at depth. It gets into the cavities. Um, and th that means that the, the, the ice shelves melt much more rapidly. So these are the processes that we're trying to understand, absolutely key to understanding this role of, of Antarctica, both in sea level and in the global ocean circulation. Um, the main barrier to doing that, of course, is, is just the ice. Okay, So wherever you go on that region, the continental shelf, you'll encounter some of the ice, um, or beneath the ice shelves. The ice shelves are completely impenetrable, right? They're, they're just on oh, ice 200 metres to 2,000 metres thick. You simply can't get there with however powerful the ship is. So the key to observing these regions and turning what are basically data deserts at the moment into something where we can actually observe enough to actually observe process, key processes is to extend the reach beyond the ship 
Um, and essentially, so I can think of two ways of doing that. One is um, if you want to penetrate through these ice masses and measure beneath them, then presently the only way to do that is to put people on the ice, and that requires helicopters. So they've come up, and they've, they'll be discussed at length, I'm sure, at this meeting. But you need heavy lift helicopters. They're going to put gear and people on the surface if you're going to access from above and put in instruments that are going to stay there beneath the ice shelf. Uh, either that or you've, you've got a long process of technology development, which may eventually get there within the life of the ship. Uh, to get autonomous vehicle, autonomous technology to do that. Then to get beneath, the other way to get beneath the ice um, is to use autonomous submersibles. Uh, you can use remote operation, and that's one, but then you're limited by tether length. So it's real full autonomy is the only way to really explore these. The large of these ice shelves are, are basically, basically 500 kilometers by 500 kilometers. It's a massive area, which essentially is a data black hole at the moment. And so the key is to, to extend the reach through autonomous technology um, into the future. Uh, to finish off now, just by commenting that although you know, having that autonomous ability to reach beyond the ship autonomously is absolutely essential to get any, to get any data, data in, the, in these regions. And actually having that capability allows you to expand what the ship can do anywhere and just multitask in, in the ship. So you, having that kind of technology, which will come on board, um, is a way of essentially extending the return from any cruise wherever it goes. But for these regions, particularly beneath the ice shelves, is absolutely essential. Um, and that's where I wanted to finish. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Our next flash talk is by Peter Neff. Peter is, is an assistant research professor at the University of Minnesota. Uh, thank you, Jamin. And thank you to the NSF and the Academy for having me here. Um, I'll be talking to you about uh, coastal ice rises and the potential for drilling and recovering ice cores to reconstruct uh, climate ice dynamics in the marine environment uh, right at the ice ocean atmosphere interface uh, around the periphery of Antarctica. So this map here, of course, has ice rises outlined in red. Um, these are essentially miniature ice sheets independently grounded and accumulating masses of snow and ice um, that are ideal so uh, sites for ice coring. And we have drilled some ice cores to bedrock on ice rises. You can see these blue dots here are, are cores that have been drilled to bedrock. Um, and we have additional opportunities in critical areas to recover more of these ice cores. The main challenge in this sort of work is that we do have to get on the ground, recover the ice and return it to our labs back in the States. Um, we can't do that work uh, with, with drones. Um, there we go. So zooming in on West Antarctica. So what I have here is a map of West Antarctica on the right. Uh, I have a light overlay of the United States on here just to show you the, the size that we're talking about here. Existing ice cores, uh, a part of our, our West Antarctic ice core array are open circles and potential ice rise cores at the coast are uh, the, the filled circles. So we do have a fantastic ice core array thanks to the work of colleagues um, in the late 1990s, early 2000s. Um, but it does have this California sized, West Coast sized uh, blind spot right where, uh, as Natalia and Ted and Adrian have, have made clear, where all of the change is happening. Um, so we're not sampling these low elevation uh, coastal regions that are very different than the high dry interior of, of the ice sheet. Um, and thankfully, we have these ice rises that have been sitting there accumulating snow and ice and recording environmental conditions with the chemistry um, that gets attached to, to the snow. Um, and all we have to do is get there and recover these, these records. The inset there at bottom left shows uh, an overflight uh, with ice thickness data that was collected by NASA Operation Icebridge, some of the only data we have over these uh, ice rises to give us uh, a sense of, of what we can do here. And I've highlighted Martin Peninsula for a very exciting reason. I think it's the first place that we will be able to get on the ground uh, as soon as next, next year. Um, an important thing here as well is, is that our, our waste ice core array was collected about 20 years ago. So if we do recover new ice cores on the coast, we don't have a, an existing array that's actually up to the present day. One of the main things we do with, with ice cores, of course, is put in context uh, the extremes of, of any uh, you know, temperature or of changes in the winds, changes in snowfall of current decades, put them in context with the longer record. Uh, we can't do that without a, an updated record as, as well. So we have a bit of, of work to do in inland Antarctica that, that is very, uh, very feasible. Um, so my final slide here, I just want to highlight what we can, can uh, reconstruct with these sorts of records. So of course, ice cores give us annual climate environmental 
information via chemical proxies for the last uh, centuries uh, to millennia at these sort of sites. We also, using ice penetrating radar, can understand uh, some of the past ice dynamics of these locations and use them as dipsticks for, for past ice thickness. Um, we, if we were to drill all the way to bedrock at these sites, you could get exposure ages for past ice extent. Uh, borehole ter temperatures give a very direct perspective on any, um, any uh, uh, temperature trends in recent decades. Um, and better understanding the mass balance across these sort of features at a sort of kilometer scale is really helpful for improving our uh, models, uh, climate models, and, and the models that are used to, to reconstruct uh, surface mass balance on, on a larger scale. Um, so as I said, I'm, I'm excited to, to be able to share with you that we are partnering uh, with the, the Korean Polar Research Institute and the RV Aeron as soon as next season, um, pending a few approvals and, and organizational details. Um, and that would allow us to get access to uh, the first of these ice rises and for the first time collect uh, a 150 meter deep ice core supported from a research vessel. So we in the ice core community are very much uh, terrestrial folks that rely on, on access traditionally uh, via fixed wing or, or, or tractor support. And so that is uh, somewhat possible for these uh, locations, but of course access via ship where you can uh, get right near uh, any of these ice rises. You have a lot of options for ice rises given uh, the changing nature of, of sea ice conditions. Um, so again, that, that ship with helicopter support is um, is really crucial and, and having a, a refrigerated shipping container on, on deck as well. And just to give you a sense of, of the time we're talking about, so for the 150 meters that we've proposed for next season, that's sort of on the order of one to two weeks of work, very simple. We've done it thousands, of, hundreds of times uh, drilling ice cores in the past, um, if we wanted to recover a quarter bedrock, you're looking at a, a much larger logistical footprint due to the, the drilling fluid that we need and the, the structures uh, to support that sort of work. Um, but because these ice rises are also likely frozen to the bed, you could be looking at uh, records of climate extending back to the last glacial um, in you know locations that are directly adjacent to changing places like Thwaites Glacier, uh, that sort of thing. So thanks again uh, for having me. I'll take questions after. Thank you, Peter. We now have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, we'll read out those questions that are coming in from Slido. All right, first question is for Ted. Um, let's see. I was surprised to see you attributed recent mass loss to MICI, marine ice cliff instability. I was not aware that any of this loss was MICI related. I thought it was due to MISI at marine ice sheet instability. Can you please clarify? Yeah, uh, I did uh, modify a slide from a, a paper that talked about MICI, but I was talking about marine ice shelf instability. I may have misspoken, uh, but uh, no, I agree. Uh, ice cliff instability is um, possibly occurring on some of the Greenland glaciers right now, sort of a slow rate. Uh, it's part of the Thwaites study to um, model uh, the possibility of ice cliff runaway periods for the retreat of the West Antarctic ice sheet. But right now that retreat that we've seen, the red areas on the um, elevation difference map are uh, mostly due to processes closely related to marine ice shelf instability. Thank you. Um, this is for the <laughs> thank you for the panel. Um, what is the relative importance of maintaining a presence in West Antarctica versus working in the data sparse East Antarctica? Mr. Pro again. Uh, this is for the whole panel. So whoever would like to uh, jump in. Did you say it again? Please? Oh yes, yes. Sorry. Um, what is the relative importance of maintaining a presence in West Antarctica versus the data sparse East Antarctica? Clearly, both are important. Yeah. And over the course of the next ARV, uh, all of those areas are likely to be visited, which is kind of why I wanted to show, as Peter also showed, areas of interest uh, all around the coast of Antarctica. Um, let me expound on that. Places that are going to be very difficult to impossible to get to from the land-based logistics side because of crevassing or because of the distances involved um, and, and the... Uh, the long logistical chain that's required to put a group of people out there with um, equipment to study the area or drill the ice stones. Yeah, I mean, I would add that our logistical infrastructure and our, our history of, of expert field work is, is strongly 
uh, anchored in West Antarctica, as are a lot of the the more pressing questions on thinking of the time scale of of sea level rise and ice sheet change. Um, so maintaining our presence in in West Antarctica, I, I rate uh, very highly, and I think uh, you know the work around the East Antarctic margin is is perhaps more ripe for partnership with other national Antarctic programs. Yeah, I would also add that the understanding more about the East Antarctic is really going to impact the longer term projections of where we're headed. So what we'll see in the coming few decades is sort of the beginning of the fate of the ice sheets on longer time scales. And that's really important to get at. And we have very little knowledge of Eastern Antarctica right now, so. Thank you. Um, this question is specific for Adrian. Never mind, I lost it. Um, for future, I just moved it on me. There, there you go. For future deployment of long-range AUVs that may be larger, more capable, and are and there are there critical ARV issues that we deal with now. For example, over the side or stern lift capability capacity development. Excuse me, can't read today. Deployment recovery appliances, ship lab support facilities, uh, data communications technologies, etc. Let me know if you need me to read that again. Um, no, okay, so probably the um, I guess it depends on the the model that's run. So, so the the main the main thing you'll need is is deck space. So I was impressed to see that that's actually that's uh, is bigger, and and you're you're planning to have a, a large deck space, and that's the key thing. So um, if if it's designed as a um, as something that's that's going to be there permanently, then then I guess you'll need some of that sort of if you like garage space might get get used for a for a uv preparation and storage um and then uh, it's basically then it's just cranes to get them over the side um if it's going to be more the case that, that research groups uh, are going to come on with their their um their platforms then again it's either cranes or they'll bring their own launch facility um and then the main thing will be just having the deck space to 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 do that and not get in the way of other things um so the, the larger ones in particular, um, they end up taking up quite a lot of deck, deck space at times. And that, I think that's probably your main your main requirement, but it looks like you've got that well covered, I think. Thank you. A question for Peter. Are light helos enough or do you need heavy lift helos for the coastal domes um, or any alternative technologies? Yeah, thanks for that question. I guess the the quick answer is we'll see. We'll try next season with uh, light helos uh, with the uh, the Korean Polar Research Institute. And uh, I think it would be more if if you do want to recover a core to bedrock when you're talking, uh, you know, that many thousands, quite a few thousands of pounds of equipment and ice that you need to move back and forth. That might require heavier lift. But um, yeah, for the scale that that I'm proposing to to begin with, I think light helos are going to be great. I think my, my general <laughs> Uh, approach to, to the coastal ice rises and any work out there, I think for for many of us is a sort of a, a mountaineering style, fast and light is the way to get things done because we know that there are many variables that play out there. Thank you, Peter. Can one of the speakers clarify through ice access needs into the marine cavity beyond helos, i.e. drilling access needs for instrument deployment? Well, I can say something like that. So at the moment, then, then it's all it's done through hot water drilling, um, mel melting holes essentially, and that requires quite a lot of heavy gear to to go onto the ice and, and a team of people. Um, I mean, there there has been there have been proposals and people have attempted to develop, um, if you like, uh, almost like the Filbreth probe style thing, a, a heated capsule which will melt its way through. Um, and then deploy once once you've got through, and that's there is a potential there for something lighter and perhaps more autonomous. But I don't know if anyone has ever got anything like that to work. Um, so at the moment, it's a question of of heavy gear um, and melting holes is the way is the way people get through. Um, but possibly on the timescale of the, of this ship, if we're looking forty years away, then then other technologies might might come along. Uh, does, does that actually answer the question? 
Yes, thank you. Uh, for Peter, are those drilling rates set in stone based on current technology? Uh, do you think technology will evolve to increase rates in the future? Um, yeah, they're they're not necessarily set in stone. There's not a a large uh, drive for the, for the you know uh, adding maximum speed for ice core drilling, but we certainly would work with with the U.S. ice drilling program to you know, convey that time is of the essence in these sort of places where where you have a lot of pressure from uh, other vessel timelines and, and weather and that sort of thing. But um, yeah, so you can certainly would want to try to keep a deeper drilling to one one season uh, and the shallow drilling, we would try to you know, work as hard as possible to keep it within sort of a one week time scale, just get the core and, and get out with a few other peripheral measurements. Thank you. Uh, what are the logistical, logistic political limitations to doing this sort of work in collaboration with international researchers using one of the international uh, Antarctic research vessels that can support HELOs? Um, I.e., if NSF can't add HELOs, what can they do to support this sort of work? I'm, I'm, I've worked with several of the international Antarctic programs. Um, typically, what happens is that um, the international program has an idea that is similar to something that you're interested in working on, and they can take a few uh, U.S. researchers on board or one or two and, uh, and add them into a project that they already had underway. And what you can't really do is... Um, ask for a large project that consumes a lot of the resources of the ship in order to thoroughly investigate an area and support whatever array of interests the U.S. side might have. Um, but the other hurdles are things like getting both nations to approve the uh, field work and the timing. I know I've worked with Korea and their schedule for saying, yes, we're going to do that this coming Austral summer is much closer to the actual Austral summer than the NSFs. And that makes it difficult to, to plan and, and, uh, and execute. That said, it has worked wonderfully well to work with the Koreans. I wanna you know, acknowledge that they've been good partners because they've been interested in some of the same areas for now. Yeah, it's the difference of, of uh, you know, being the passenger with fantastic colleagues or being in the driver's seat. And if we have, helicopter capability for, for the sort of work that I'm interested in, um, you know, we can, can lead on that. And I think that's uh, really important to consider. That marks the end of session two. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, the additional questions that were entered in Slido will be um, looked at by the committee and we'll send answers as we can. We will now be having lunch um, in the Great Hall, um, back where we had uh, coffee and, and light breakfast earlier. And then we will be back in the auditorium here at 1.15. So please be back seated, ready to listen to presentations at 1.15. And thank you all to all of the speakers this morning. Stage, but also any other tools and technologies or approaches that may be deployed from a vessel or through other means, for example, satellite remote sensing, which I did not ask them to put that in there. Our first speaker is going to be Matthew Siegfried. Matthew is a glaciologist who runs the Mines Glaciology Laboratory. Larry's eight, come on down. Okay, so just to be clear, I think these are a 10 minute talk, right? Yeah. Yeah, eight with two. Eight, eight with two, okay. Uh, is, is this forward and back? Yes. Cool. Hello, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Welcome back to the Go ahead. Uh, welcome back for the technology section. Uh, and I'm a glaciologist and geophysicist, so that's kind of going to color uh, everything I say. Uh, and we'll be talking about technology and technology gaps, really, uh, looking at ice, water, ocean, and solid earth processes. Uh, and when I was thinking about the little clickers not working. Whoop. 
there we go. Uh, when I was thinking about this uh, as a geophysicist, I think about you know the next 50 years, this kind of long-term time horizon. Um, and the question that I kept coming up with is where actually will the coast be? This is actually something we can't do well today. So projecting this out for 50 years and thinking about the processes and constraining uh, all of this change is a, a, a big challenge with some key technological gaps. And there are really two coastlines that I like to think about. There's the grounding line where the ice actually meets the ocean. Then there's the ice margin. And both of these coasts matter a lot to the ice sheet. And so I'll go through two, um, or sorry, three uh, processes that are kind of key in setting where the coastlines are in the, the near shore processes that uh, are related to these coasts. Uh, the first will be solid earth, earth motion, which we talked about already a little bit today, so that'll be great. Uh, then we'll talk about a little bit uh, about grounded ice freshwater dynamics, because that really can change the, the morphology of the coastline, uh, and it changes the um, biogeochemical cycles that are happening at the coast in these pseudo estuary environments. Finally, we'll hop out to the ice margin, talk about polynias and, and marginal ice zone evolution. Uh, so I don't need to introduce any of this GIA stuff because the best people in the world who do it already did. That's actually a, a, a little scary to follow Natalia and Doug talking about the solid earth. Uh, but GIA is really important. We need to understand how the solid earth is deforming to understand where the coastline is even going to be and then the processes that are involved in the nearshore environment. We, we measure solid earth deformation across the low latitudes all the time, and we can look at a, an entire range of timescale of processes. I just have one example from Sushil Adusamili, uh, who we know from the, his Antarctic work, but he also did some great work looking at terrestrial water storage changes in North America. We have over a thousand GNSS stations from which we can infer solid earth motion. We can also look cross coast uh, at uh, with geodetic observations uh, to look at solid earth Earth deformation in coastal environments, looking at tectonic regimes, going from subaerial uh, geodetic instrumentation to uh, seafloor ge uh, geodesy tools, which usually is you know fixing a monument on the seabed and then coming back and surveying it in repeatedly over multiple years. In Antarctica, uh, we've already talked about how we take these solid earth deformation measurements and it involves finding solid earth, which is a problem in Antarctica. We go to none attacks anywhere there's exposed bedrock, we put a GNSS instrument on it, uh, and then we wait and collect data until we can uh, figure out what the uplift rates are. If you look at kind of how many measurements we have uh, over 1000 kilometer length scales, 1500 kilometer length scales, you're talking about something like six. Um, on the left, we have the Amundsen Sea embayment. On the right, you have uh, the Totten region. You know, we don't have a lot of observations. Uh, and so this, to me, is one of these key technological gaps. We have this process we know is important. We don't have the tools to measure it at the scales we need it. Uh, and so in the, the seafloor sense, looking at seafloor geodesy, we're really limited by the ocean logistical capabilities. These tools are to do seafloor geodesy are well established. We have NSF facilities for this to develop the technology to deploy it. But we need to get to these iced over areas. We need to be, be able to get there repeatedly to take these measurements over years and years to see what these uplift and deformation rates look like. The grounded ice is a different story because I don't think we've ever actually taken a measurement like this underneath grounded ice. We have the geophysical tools likely to take these measurements, but it's we're kind of at the error thresholds of them. So we need to work both on deployment strategies and the tools themselves to increase the precision. We also have this problem where if we want to look at one point on the bed, all of your surface in instrumentation is advecting over it. Fine and slow ice areas, but the places we care about are fast ice areas. And so you need networks of sensors, right, to image one spot on the bed as all of this instrumentation is flowing across. When we talk about networks of sensors, that means we need to care about power systems and communication systems. And we've actually fallen a little bit behind in that sense. Uh, this is an example from a, a Korean GNSS deployment from a boat, from a helicopter. Um, and, you know, this is about 10% of the weight of the, the pole net style GNSS sites that we deploy. We need to get to this level and then beyond it to be able to do these sorts of geodetic measurements at scale. Looking at um, coastal processes and, and freshwater in, interaction, uh, we need to understand the, the networks of rivers and lakes underneath the ground ice sheet because all of that flows out into the Southern Ocean at the coast, um, controlling the biogeochemical cycles. Um, we know that there's carbon exchange between the sediments and the water. We know there's micronutrient circulation. John Hawkins is gonna talk about that tomorrow. Uh, and we know that it's teeming with microbial life. 
We also know that these things change on, on timescales from days and months all the way through centuries. An active um, lake underneath the ice sheet fills and drains over you know, six months to maybe a decade. The lake will stay there for about 200 years. And so we need to go to these lakes often to be able to instrument them. We need to image a lot of these lakes uh, to understand the diversity of the hydraulic system. Here's the logistical footprint of the two times we've accessed a subglacial lake in Antarctica in human history. Uh, the logistical, logistical footprint looks exactly the same, six years different, and this is all actually 2008 funded um, technology. So we've made no progress in advancing this technology. And so we can't access the freshwater systems we need. We need to increase the agility of these access tools, the scalability, so we can deploy it from a boat, from a twin otter, from a bassler. This is all traverse supported at the moment. And we need to increase the power efficiency because that's really what controls the size here. Uh, finally, looking at the ice edge, um, as the oceanographers in the room know, we throw a lot of tools at the Southern Ocean, but all of them kind of generally fall into this snapshot science uh, style. So we take a boat out and we do CTT casts. Maybe we get a seal to measure for nine months. Maybe we get a glider for one or two years. All of these processes are happening at depth but are continually varying. There's huge seasonal variability, huge interannual variability and decadal variability that we need to understand. Um, and we don't have the instrumentation out there yet. We don't have any sort of backbone network to, to put these snapshot records into context. Uh, we're trying to do year round um, information from space, which is a huge advance. These uh, snapshot records are seasonally biased to when we can get there. So we have some ability uh, to combine ground and satellite data, but that only works in some places, not the most important places necessarily. And so we need to, uh, can we get the next slide? Thank you. We need to think about, you know, big observing networks to understand the ocean at depth, at the time and space scales we need it. Uh, I personally think that fiber optic technology is the path forward here. It's proven in Antarctica, both in the ocean and in subglacial environments. And it's proven at low latitudes where we can use fiber for any number of science questions on the coast. We've looked at, you know, whales and ship traffic. We've looked at uh, near nearshore tectonics with fiber optics. And so you can imagine that we can lay out fiber optic curtains, for example, in front of an ice shelf and start to look at heat exchange and close our heat budget. We can look at salinity potentially with fiber optic cables. We can look at basal melt rates with fiber optic cables. They really enable a lot of technology, but we're gonna to need to adapt it from the low latitudes to do this right and well. The good news is we, uh, we have a great target right in our backyard at McMurdo Station. The Ross Kalinia is one of these huge features where we can dig into these processes in detail. And so we, we have a great location to do this and we have the tools. Uh, so it's just, you know, getting out there and deploying fiber. Fiber is great. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Fiber is great, but uh, it's not going to tell us everything. If we're looking at frontal processes, we need to look at the top, the bottom, and the front all at the same time in high resolution. Uh, and so we need to extend these networks with the things everyone else will talk about, uh, which give you uh, kind of that detailed process scale that we're looking for. With that, I'll just leave you with a little tour of what the latest subglacial lake logistical footprint, subglacial lake access logistical footprint looks like. And it's it's big, and we need to scale this down. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, we're going to hold all the questions until the end, but just a gentle reminder to drop your questions in, into Slido. Um, we're continuing to use that platform. So um, uh, I already said that. Yes, sorry. Um, our next speaker is going to be Chris Zappa. Chris is a lecturer in Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia University. Chris, entering the speed talk realm. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. Let's pop it up here. So,
Okay, everybody on the deck, right? That one, that one, thank you. So what I just introduced was a, um, a technological capability, a UAV. Um, and I wanted to start with that because it, it gives you a real sense of what potential capabilities are for working from ships in any kind of coastal area or on the open ocean. <clears throat> so gliders have been around for decades now and are used um, in many um, systems, but drones have are in, really in their infancy in terms of the capabilities for doing science and with science payload. So <clears throat> I wanted to talk here about a single capability with this this specific drone, but you can apply this to many other drones of varying endurance or payload. This one specifically um, is a vertical takeoff and landing capability. Can I go back one? There. So it, as you saw, it takes off off the deck and then it flies, has forward flight. Um, it can la it can fly for eight, eight, at least eight hours, typically up, maybe potentially up to 20 hours, depending on what your payload is. I can carry payloads from say 15 kilograms up to 20 kilograms. You can take off in 30 knot winds off of a ship or land. Um, well, key thing we're working on now is um, to be able to fly in ice ice zones where you would have icing on the wings or the uh, aircraft. But we're also developing payloads where you have a modular base and you could add in whatever sensors you want. And then that would snap onto the front of the aircraft. We've already developed a number of payloads. They're um, essentially visible thermal infrared imaging, hyperspectral imaging, um, direct covariance heat fluxes, momentum flux, um, LIDAR, scanning LIDAR systems, radiation sensors, all these things that we can use to measure um, air-sea ocean interaction. Um, so just some of the capabilities we have right now with this aircraft or many aircraft, you can have complete autonomous takeoff and landing from ships or from land. And it's critical to have multiple, multiple aircraft for continuous flight operations, but also um, you want to fly high for certain um, imaging and fly lower for, for measuring fluxes or other properties. Um, we have this high endurance flights, as I mentioned. The key thing is that we have a long range capability. So you can fly 50 nautical miles away from the ship, have all your data telemeter back to the ship in real time. So you can retask where if you have a set flight plan and you want to retask because you see something that's very interesting, um, you can look at it in more high resolution or you can continue on it or just adjust your uh, flight path. Also with this long range capability, you can send out a one and continue on with another one for another hundred, you know, another 50 nautical miles or so, or you get to talk to surface vehicles or un underwater autonomous vehicles. Um, and as, as I alluded to, it's, actually, there are a lot of pictures from the tropics, but I've done this in the, in Antarctica, a lot of the examples later, um, but it allows you to go um, send your aircraft out if you have a, a flight plan, you can continue on that flight plan. If you're really searching for something, say a bloom, an algal bloom, you can send it out. It can fly around until you find it. You find this nice, beautiful bloom. You bring the ship over where you are. You send all your assets in the water, put your gliders out, map it with the drone. And we can look at, um, say here, the ocean color and the thermal imaging impact or the, the heat structure, the temperature structure from the thermal imaging. This also leads to a kind of converge, um, convergent mission, which is part of this real-time mission control where you have all this data coming back. There's a serious challenge with how to handle all that data. So there's storage, movement, analysis, visualization, all happening real time. So this is a, a future objective of this new paradigm for computational science or earth science in real time. So it's going to take teams of data scientists and software engineers 
working on data flows from the UAV or the surface vehicles to the ship back to shore. So you can have a whole team working on this simultaneously. Um, and I'll just want to, um, the last point here about edge computing, where you can do, there's a whole burgeoning field of working with data processing on board before you kilometer the, kilometer the data back. So what do I see future capabilities? Um, say five to 10 years from now, everything we see here, we, we're able to do what I've shown so far. And I see 10 to 20 years from now, you can have streamlined deployments, more UA, more um, payloads as they things become more miniaturized. You can have do more um, um, studies, specifically one right now that I didn't mention. We have um, working on a grav grav gravimeter at Le Mans to miniaturize it and potentially fly it from the aircraft. Um, and then 20 to 40 years from now, you could have an arm armada of UAVs or autonomous aircraft carrier or a remote recharging station where you could have a, a number of these flying um, simultaneously without enough, without people or around or required. So I just wanted to touch on a few things. These, all these are, are in the presentation you can look at later, but it allows for precise tracks, low levels of vibration, so you can make great turbulence measurements, low, pro low profile aircraft allows for clean radiometric measurements. Um, and the unoccupied craft, when we fly over the sea ice where it's not safe for piloted or um, aircraft emergency landings. Um, so I mentioned that the some of the payloads we have, the visible thermal infrared, visible um, near infrared hyperspectral imaging for ocean color, ice type and melt pond distributions, for instance. You can do radiation, unobstructed ocean ice albedo measurements, the um, uh, direct covariance fluxes, LIDAR to look at ocean waves, ice, ice surface topography, and the gravimeter that we're um, using to measure, eventually used to measure bathymetry. And I'll just stop there for now. Thank you. That's okay. It won't bite. All right. Thank you so much, Chris. Our next talk is by Oscar Schofield. Oscar is a distinguished professor and chair of the Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. Thanks. All right. So I'm going to take a view of, you know, where we're going to be 30 to 50 years from now, um, especially since if 2031, we get our ship, it's just a, under a decade out. Um, and really my theme is building on everything we've heard so far from this morning there. And really the future is gonna be about sensor web networks. It's no longer gonna be about a single platform. And if you look at the Antarctic and the Southern Ocean, really fundamentally what limits us is access. And so I think the sensor webs are gonna transform that. Uh, next slide. Oops. So just to give you an idea of how much things change in 30 years, that was my first cruise as a graduate student. And we had this amazing technology called a fax. <laughs> and it sent us a sea surface temperature satellite map. And it actually was fundamentally a change of how we went to sea. And it was a unique opportunity. If you look now and you go to Breezy or some of these sites, you can get ocean winds, you can get temperature forecasts, you can get ocean forecasts. And so that's a time frame we're talking about. And so um, I think it's important for us to sort of keep a big view because we're gonna be able to have a much clearer view of the dynamics of a system. And as an ecologist, the dynamics drive the biological responses. And so you can't solve one without the other. So first off, if you go to sea, what you need to do is have context. And so if I'm going to a site and, you know, I'm obviously partial to the Western or Peninsula um, where there's lots of land stations, I should have a complete map of everything that's happened in the ocean a month prior to me deploying. That's actually a doable thing. You have land bases that will require international collaboration and those are landing ports 
for autonomous vehicles. So this is a picture of a glider that uh, was launched from Palmer Station, went up, visited King George, and then eventually went down to Rothra and was picked up um, by UK scientists. There is no reason you can't now rebattery and send it back and maintain a complete backbone so that if we get people on the ship, this amazing new tool, we have a full context to maximize the efficiency of the science. So we spent a lot of the time as I was trained to go map the ocean before I started my experiment. I want the map so I can spend the entire time at sea doing my experiments. So I think that's gonna require a new culture. It's been evolving very nicely at NSF with international partnerships. And over the next decade or two, I really hope that accelerates so that really we're leveraging all the resources in this remote location. You know, and then you embed coastal maps within things like the SOCOM array of the BioArgo system that is deployed and hopefully will continue. When you're on the ship, you know, if you're an ecologist, really the first thing you got to do is separate out the physical transport of your ecosystem from the transformation within the ecosystem. And solving the transport problem has been a fundamental hindrance for doing ecology at sea. So I can go on a ship, I can have a CTD rosette. I really need 10, 20 mobile CTD rosettes flying. Again, the cost of doing these missions is less than a ship day. And so the ability for a ship to have a 500 kilometer watch circle, Adrian mentioned it before lunch. I think that's where the future is. So I know whether to go right, left, whether I sample on Thursday or Tuesday, depending on the process I wanna do. At the same time, we're undergoing a major revolution right now in sensor technology. So this is a glider bay that's getting designed right now to do holographic imaging of organisms on a glider. And they do this on BioArgo platforms now with the UVP. Um, and so we can do biology, physics, chemistry in ways we couldn't. And what I think for the future, if a ship comes with an array of autonomous vehicles that can be controlled shoreside, you don't have to dedicate a berth on a ship for at least these kinds of vehicles. Smart ones like Adrian was talking about, you do need a dedicated team. Um, you know, that the scientist now writes a proposal for a science bay, not to go buy a glider. And then you insert it and you got your mobile array. At the same time, the ship is an amazing tool. And to increase access, um, we do flow through systems right now. UCAR does the PCO2 measurements that so many of us use, but getting essentially the ability to add new technologies that are emerging into that system really is a heavy lift. And it's not because people don't want to, because it takes work, it's people time, but the sensors are getting better. And so what I envision is I could write a proposal and have an advanced array plugged in to the ship system and with improved technology, have it shipped back to me during the cruise, you know, because the bandwidth is increasing. At the same time, you know, sort of imaging systems like shore-based, you know, ship-based LIDAR systems, reflectance sensors will essentially tie us directly to the NASA and NOAA arrays so we can constantly calibrate and improve the algorithms so that there's not a disconnect between um, agencies and algorithms we develop. Finally, you know, we should be taking advantage of smart things. You know, evolution is an amazing process. Um, and if you want to find fronts, close heat budgets and everything, you know, the elephant seals did it for us. Not all our ship cruises. You know, and so the idea of studying dynamic things requires that you put, you know, sensors on but you also increase the throughput directly to the scientists in the field at the time um, so that they can essentially mission plan around features they want. And then sort of my final part is where you automate it. Um, and this has actually been done in temperate waters 
um, where essentially you run several numerical mode uh, models in forecast mode. Within that model, you embed hypothetical robots. You then hand over the flight control of the actual gliders in the water to the model. You as a scientist sit in the middle. You say, I want to hit a river plume. I want to hit, hit a algal bloom feature. And then you let the model essentially do all the waypoint commands. So you can fly a swarm of things um, and not kill your technicians. Uh, eight gliders will kill a technician. That's about where they spontaneously combust. At the same time, you're getting real-time data simulation going in to allow you to essentially hone in if you're running four forecast models, which one's giving you the best answer with the fidelity you want. And it becomes a recursive loop to support the scientists in the middle. And so I think automated sensor webs with this great ship vehicle as the mothership is gonna change how we go to sea. Thank you, Oscar. I'm not sure that I want to know how you know eight gliders will <laughs> kill your technician, but I trust you. I trust you've tested it safely. All right. Thank you so much, Oscar. Um, our next speaker is Brittany Schmidt. Brittany is an associate professor in the astronomy and earth and atmospheric sciences at Cornell University. Hello. Uh, nice to see everybody. Um, so I'm going to spend some time talking about robotic under ice platforms and the many uh, scales that we might use these to um, observe in the future. Um, so we've seen Antarctica, obviously, a number of different ways today. But the point that I'd like to make, of course, as many have already, is that, you know, about half of this coastline is comprised uh, by um, ice shelves by really thick ice that's at the margin between the solid earth and the ocean. Uh, it's a very, very difficult barrier to make observations through, and we have a surprising dearth of observations as a result. Um, perhaps the best uh, studied of these regions now, um, uh, from uh, at least from an ice shelf perspective, is, is the Ross and now Thwaites. We're doing a lot more work there, too. Um, there's a couple of examples of under ice robotics in other places, but I'm going to focus on kind of these two stories for today, just as a um, to kind of maybe inspire where we may go in the future. Um, so this is a figure that Justin Lawrence put together as part of a proposal to work with the New Zealand program um, to start to get uh, perspectives underneath the Ross ice shelf. And so the Ross ice shelf is roughly a thousand kilometers across. So that's kind of the scale where we've got really high resolution information from the front of the shelf where you can understand uh, material forming in the plinia, how that ocean forcing affects the front of the shelf. Um, we have one or two data points from underneath the ice shelf uh, and the hot water drilling programs through A and Z have really made a lot of progress in that so that we can kind of move backwards and get bigger and bigger pictures about what's happening underneath the ice shelf, um, relating back to the same process that Adrian mentioned this morning. Um, but the point here also is that at each place in this system, there is a robotic observation platform that's ideally suited, and those are going to change over the next couple of years. And I'm going to focus on recent uh, uh, ROV operations because that's um, our, our work, but I'll talk a little bit about where all of these um, processes can be explored by robotic platforms. Um, so this is ICEFIN, uh, which is our uh, underwater, uh, it's a hybrid AVROV, so it can do autonomous motions, but it's tethered, and it's done like that so that we can get through thick ice. And so a lot of the time we use ROVs thinking of them as kind of swimming eyes, um, but this one is really modular. This is an ocean class AUV on a string and much smaller and modular so that we can change everything about the system in order to observe different processes in different environments. And so it's long and relatively thin. It has the same kinds of sensors. It's got about 10 science sensors, depending on how we deploy it, similar to an open uh, ocean AUV, um, but it only weighs about 250 pounds and each of those pieces comes apart and so we can make it portable into the field. And so I'm going to show you two different cases, um, the cold base and the warm base and why we'd want to see all of those together. Um, and this is just the ROV perspective on that. 
So this is near the grounding line of the CAM ice stream um, as explored in 2019. And what we know is that those, those crevasses, so those kind of up and downs that you can see in this image here, were not resolved by the radar or by seismic. And so the vehicle at first, at first glance can actually resolve features that we don't see with the others. There's also a lot of detail at the seafloor, which we'll zoom into. Um, and this is from an upcoming paper, should be out in maybe three weeks in Nature Geoscience led by a PhD student, uh, Justin Lawrence. But we can also zoom in into the individual processes and get this kind of spatial awareness of what's going on underneath the ice. So you notice these crevasses become real world places. I'll show you some zoom in data of, of that in a moment. But you can see seafloor processes that involve bioturbation. We can see the imprints of the uh, of the uh, crevasses where they used to reside on the seafloor and where they are now uh, with the ice uh, now lifted off of the seafloor. Um, so a lot of perspectives on the ocean, the solid earth and the ice processes all in one view. And then we can zoom in and look at how the spatial uh, characterization of the ocean impacts what we see in the ice. And so here we've got everything from pretty much stable um, ice ocean interactions in balance at the very bottom of this, which you can observe not just from the ocean temperatures, which you can get from moorings, but also in the texture of the sidewalls of the crevasse. So we actually drove ice up into the crevasse. And what you can see also at the very top of this is the transition into freeze on at the top of it. So we're actually observing the ice pump directly in, in morphological terms in oceanographic terms and in glaciologic terms. So now how about the worm base? So this is the work that's actually coming out next week in nature from the MELT project and ITGC. Um, so what we did is we did the same project um, but at the grounding zone of Thwaites Glacier. And so this is all data from the vehicle and what it gives you is that heat budget in the water column. So this is in terms of uh, thermal driving. So you can see the very warm water making it all the way to the grounding line of Thwaites. But you can see the real importance of the very, very fine scale detail right at the surface. And that's the real story of the two papers that are coming out next week is that what you would measure from the ocean mooring and what you would measure and assume from the vertical melt rates is not the story underneath the ice. We get something like five meters a year of vertical melt rates. But when you get in situ, you see it's actually maybe 30 or 50 meters inside of the crevasses and creating all of this topography along the bottom of the sea, a bottom of the ice that's not resolved other ways. So this is just a perspective on how the melt rate changes as a function of the ice shelf geometry, which is an unresolved parameter in everything we're doing. So you think about a place like Thwaites where rifting and crevasses are becoming a major part of its disintegration, but all of the processes that are accumulating in there from a glaciological process, but also from an ocean influence perspective are not resolvable until you get in with, with tools on this scale. And so that's what underwater vehicles allow us to do. And in particular, what ROVs allow us to do. So they allow us to do things like this, which is drive directly to the sites of the melting. You can see this is basal ice uh, losing particulates. We've got sensors on there to measure the oceanographic conditions as well as oxygen levels, things like that, that you'd need to understand for ocean and for microbial processes. This is the actual arrival at the grounding line right here, um, where you can see the ice here, and we're gonna see it actually sitting on the seafloor back here. So the first in situ measurements of melting at the grounding line by a platform. And so these ROVs allow us to get in there and actually ask those questions. Here's just a subsampling of pictures of physical processes that we can resolve by going into the environment. So those are particulates uh, in basal ice. So we think kind of uh, accreted upstream, that's perhaps subglacial water accreted onto the base of the ice shelf. And now we're, uh, or sorry, upstream of the grounding line that we can now observe in the ocean. We've got basal ice processes and terraces forming in the lower. And then you can actually see some of the interactions between um, materials being plucked off of the, um, off of the continent and then dragged out into the ocean. So all of these are processes that become uh, resolvable when you can make it to the ice ocean interface. And so that's the story here is if we think about this in terms of the scales of robotic platforms we need and what their accommodations are like, then this is what we're talking about. We've got a thousand kilometer system here. We have ROVs that can really make it into these very, very tight spaces and they have a place, they have a role to play, which is to get up to the ice ocean interface, to get into lakes, to get to these very tight constrained areas. All of the water columns I've just shown you are not accessible by AUVs because of their keep out range. If you're taking a $5 million asset in, it needs to stay away from the ice. And so all of the measurements that are left in the last meter, that's the melt rates, that's the ice ocean interactions, those can't be made by AUVs 
because of this idea of vehicle safety. It makes it very, very hard. It's a challenge even in open ocean environments to drive autonomous platforms in changing geometric conditions. So ROVs have a role to play in that and they'll continue to be uh, enabled by what we do. But AUVs are getting longer and longer. I think we're at 100 kilometers or so is the longest under ice route um, mission, single mission. Um, we'll probably be able to extend that. But again, we've got, uh, we're in the deep water environment with the AUVs not up close to the ice ocean interface. And then we've got gliders also, and all of these technologies can be improved by having networks of acoustic sensors that we can use for navigation underneath the ice. So all of these could be enabled by, um, by future work. And so just to touch on a few things, we've got long range exploration goals and these will be really useful. We need to fund technology development. They need to be scientists in the loop of developing that. We don't, we're not interested in an algorithm, we're interested in a science result. And so that's where it's important to have engineers and scientists working together. But I wanna mention as well access and support because most of these critical observations really do need to get to the places. And in particular, the ROVs, if we're drilling through the ice, we need to be able to access those places. It means scalable products, it means scalable drills, it means new thinking about mobility and access infrastructure. So uh, planes, seaplanes, helos, these kinds of things and uh, more capable but smaller drill platforms. Sorry for running over, thanks. Thank you so much. It's great. All right. Thank you, Brittany. Our next speaker is Maureen Walzik. Maureen is an assistant professor in the College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences at Oregon State University. No, I didn't. <laughs> no, no, no worries at all. Never marry a poll if you ever want anybody to say no, your name I, right again. I hate getting the same wrong. Did you say it? Say it proper. It, um, it's Walzak. Walzak. Walzak, which I'm sure is not correct in Polish, but that's my husband's family goes with that and we're, we're gonna go with it for here. Um, thanks very much for having me. Uh, my name is Mo and I am an assistant professor at Oregon State University where I'm a paleooceanographer, but I'm not here to talk to you about research. I'm here to talk to you about instrumentation. Um, so I'm gonna agree with Brittany that this is definitely the popular projection of the day. Um, so, so for those of you who study Antarctica, I'm sure you're devastated to know that the ice sheets are grinding it away. Right, so the ice sheets are doing a very efficient job of taking all of that rock of the continent, turning it into dust essentially or cobbles. And then, and then all of that material gets transported out to the edge of the ice sheet by the ice itself, and then carried off over the shoulders of the continental shelf and actually thousands of kilometers away into the Southern Ocean where it's mixed with biogenic components forming these very, very thick deposits. So the seismic line that you can see there, that's a seismic line from the Ross Sea. And you can kind of see, is there a, is there a mouse that I can use? No, well, you, you can use your eyes. You guys are all good at this, right? So, so you can see that that contact line between the bedrock and all of those those linear things on top. That's all mud. And this is problematic for some people, right? In our first session, we talked about how these these thick burdens of sediment on the shoulders of the continent obfuscate the beautiful geology and the the bedrock geology underneath. But one man's trash is another man's treasure. There are advantages to these very thick sediment deposits. And specifically, if you know how to get at them, they have very high resolution histories in them, essentially. They can be geomagnetic histories. They can be paleoenvironmental histories of the ocean. They can tell you things about the, the history of the ice sheet and its outlet glaciers. So there's a lot of opportunity there. We just have to get to it. And how do I change the slides? The green. Oh, nice. No, I did bad. Well, anyway. Who cares? My slides, my slides do not have the production value of the earlier talks. Um, so so how, how do we get this mud home? Um, at the smallest scale, uh, we, we use hydraulically braked cores that sample the sediment water interface. So this example here is something called a multi-core. Um, there's a variety of different styles of those, but essentially this is, this is an instrument that gets you just the very, very top of the sediment surface. But unsurprisingly, that doesn't super matter for research vessel design. Right? We don't design our research vessels over the smallest things that we do. We design them for the biggest, the heaviest things that we do. And so unless you're a very specific kind of gearhead, the next five minutes are probably going to be among the longest five minutes of your life. To keep you awake, try and think about what you think the most central important component of ship design should be when it comes to overboarding handling systems. Everybody get that? Think about what, what matters there. Even, even that sentence was boring. I'm sorry. 
Um, so this this here is on the on the um, large scale of technologies that are currently available in the U.S. Um, or not, not currently anymore, I guess. The, the ship's actually been retired. This is the research vessel Noor out of Hui. And if you look, you can see this long, skinny pipe running alongside of the ship. It's red on the left-hand side, yellow on the right-hand side. It's that long, skinny pipe. On the left-hand side, there's like a big round chunk of, of what's lead. You'll have to trust me, it's lead uh, on the top. And so um, that is a jumbo piston coring system. Jumbo piston coring systems are the largest kinds of systems we can use to sample the seafloor from most platforms. If you go above that, right now in the U.S., really your only option is the Joides resolution. Um, for those of you who don't do mud, that's that's a drill ship. Next slide. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a very capable person. How do I? Yes, thank you. Okay, um, so so uh, in terms of what we can do with a jumbo piston coring system, um, the the uh, core that you saw on the the um, nor in the previous picture that's called the long core because um, people who we are super creative about what they call their stuff it's the long core. You'll remember that, right? The, the ones you're seeing in these pictures here, this is designed by the French. Um, it's called the Calypso core because it's more romantic there. Uh, on the left, we're seeing the um, the Calypso core on the RV Pourquoi Pas, which means why not? Why not build a big, fabulous research vessel? And on the right-hand side, you're seeing a cluster of pictures of the um, of the system being deployed from the Kronprins Haken, which is the new uh, the new um, Norwegian research vessel. So um, you can see again the way that these things work. On the left-hand side of that quadrant four, the red and yellow striped thing with the going vertical to the right, just a little bit right, and then down just a little bit, and then right just a little bit more to the right. Yes, that one, that slide there. So, so, so that one there, um, that's showing the the core in its uh, deployment and recovery orientation. Um, however, you obviously can't get 50 meters of core out of the core barrel when it's stuck like that. You have to bring it up alongside the rail of your ship. And so what this, uh, the other pictures are showing on the, on the right-hand side, lower right, this one's simple, right? That's the thing coming up. And there's a variety of ways to do it. On the top in the Kronsprinhaken, you can see that they have these hydraulic, those little white L-shaped things in the top. Those are hydraulic arms that like grab the core barrel and bring it in so you can work on it and take the core out of it. On the Pourquoi Pas, they have these little davits with chains. That's the lower left-hand side again. Um, but but essentially, like the, these systems are very, very simple. Um, it's They have not changed a lot since the mid-20th century. This is basically like the shark of oceanographic design. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to evolve much because it's very, very good. It's elegant, it's simple, it works, it's scalable. This is a good tool to have on your research vessel. Next slide. But it's limited, right? So this this basically this works by gravity. This, that the piston core is a punch into the sea floor just based on the weight that's above them in the in the piston core head. That we call them the bombs, even though probably that's not a that's sort of incendiary. But um, but yeah, so the, the piston core head is the only thing that gives you weight into the bottom. And if you're working, you're an ice sheet where you have rocks, that can be problematic. So if you want if you want records from the shelf. If you want to have a chance at getting through rocky sediment, and if you want to have a chance to fully capitalize on those really high resolution records and go back longer in time, right? The, the, the converse of high resolution is that you have to have a really long record to capture a meaningful interval of time. And as we go for, forward into the future, we're starting to understand that we're going to have to go further and further back in time to capture the, the climatologic analogs that are most relevant for what's happening now. And so that means we need to go deeper into the mud. Um, and again, right now in the U.S., the uh, the only capability that we have for doing that is the Droides Resolution. Um, and the Droides Resolution, the future of that program is kind of in peril. And so we actually have an opportunity with this Antarctic research vessel to turn the paradigm of undersampling the Antarctic on its head. Right now, the Antarctic is was one of the poorest regions understood from occupations by the Droides Resolution. If we put one of these bad boys on it, we have a chance to change that. So this is what's called the MIBO system. And depending on how long this takes, it seems like maybe it takes 30 or 40 years to build a research vessel. It's actually honestly kind of terrifying. Um, this, this project seems like it started when I was about six. Um, but if, if current technologies are still relevant when this thing comes off the line, this is probably what we want. This is called a MIBO system. They were actually designed in the US and then um, refined in Germany. They've been online for I think almost two decades now. Um, and so what you're seeing on the left there is a launch and recovery device, a LARS, it's just like a CTD LARS, but much bigger. The MIBO is that big blue box on top of it. It's about the size of a shipping container. And this is being deployed in this picture through the stern A-frame of the SONA. 
Um, in order to deploy this thing, uh, you have to have enough deck space for its control carrier. So basically the way this, you, you can think of this as like a coring ROV. So it, it's, it's uh, moved over to the side of the ship. And then there are videos that describe this better than my hand puppetry, but um, the thing is tilted upright and then lowered to the seafloor in that orientation. When it hits the seafloor, those little legs come out and then it's connected back to the ship with an umbilicus, an electromechanical umbilicus that allows it to talk to that control room, which is one of those containers in the deck diagram on the top. So it comes with an entourage, it's like a star. Um, with its entourage, kind of like the Jason thing, you, you, you sit in that control room and then you start steering this thing and it has two magazines of pipe. One magazine of pipe is the liner. The other magazine of pipe is the coring systems that are the cores themselves. And so basically it spuds a hole, puts down a pipe, puts a core liner in that pipe, gets a core, recovers that first liner, adds another section of wall pipe, drills down another section with a new liner in it, so on and so forth. Actually, I reversed that. So you, you, you put the whole thing in the first time, core goes down, pull out the core, add a new empty core, then add another liner. There's a, you know, there's a YouTube video that does this better than I can, but trust me, it's awesome. And you can get about 200 meters in the best cases, which is what gets you about to the science mission requirements of, of this platform. So last, we're, we're almost done now. Um, so what are your platform considerations then? What do we have to think about when we are trying to design these, these uh, systems or the capability to deploy these systems on the ship? So on the upper right hand here, we have a, I, I just snagged a, a diagram of a um, icebreaker of the Crown Prince Hawkins to talk about this, because I imagine that I, but thank you, yes, with the pointer. Um, so so the, first, the first thing for piston coring is you need to have that long space along the rail and the ability, ability to work along the rail. That's very important here because we don't have a moon pool in particular. You also have, a, have to have a handling system that's capable of pulling things out to routinely 50,000 pounds and maybe up to 100,000 pounds. So you need a crane that's really pretty heavy duty to be able to pull those piston cores out of the bottom. For the MIBO system, so on the, on the left, this is again the um, MIBO on the Sona. The MIBO has been marketed all over the world now. Many, many nations have one. They're all over Europe. They're in, in uh, Asia. We don't have one yet. Um, but in order to deploy the MIBO system, you have to have space for that Lars device that has the, the MIBO itself. You have to have space for its winch. Um, what do you guys think at the end of this talk? What do you guys think is maybe the most important design consideration when thinking about really heavy ops from this research vessel? Anyone? Very close. It's related to the A-frame, but it's even more basic. Very close, getting closer. Your wire, Larry gets it. All right, so next slide. Add an animation, design to your strength member. Um, so that turns out is the single most important thing that you can do is think about how strong you need your line to be and then make sure every other component of your system is strong enough to handle that. And that means like your deck, your stability, your winches, everything else has to go around that strength member. In this case, we really should be thinking about a strength member um, on the order of like a two inch synthetic probably in terms of safe working loads. And I also wanna make one more point. When I was reviewing this with the, um, the MARSAN group, which is the NSF uh, sediment coring group, and we were looking at the specifications, we noticed that the current specification for the A-frame on the ARV is um, 30 tons. And 30 English tons is not gonna be sufficient to do this. That's not gonna work. So we think there might've been a translation problem. If you look at the specs for the MIBO on the website, it says 30 tons, but they're talking about metric tons. A 30 ton English ton A-frame would be about equivalent to what we have on the Armstrong ride class of ships. So they're pretty small um, and much less than we have on, for example, the Atlantis. So somebody pay attention and fix that. That's it. <laughs> you guys are you're free. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Maureen. Our next speaker is Larry Mayer. Larry is a professor and director of the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping at the University of New Hampshire. Okay. Thank you, Paula. Um, I've been asked to talk about uh, acoustic mapping uh, in support of Antarctic science. And I start off with a, a beautiful slide of Piedmont Fjord in Greenland. And that's for uh, full disclosure. I've never been to Antarctica. I've never worked there. But I have uh, participated in these 15 or 16 expeditions in the high Arctic and uh, northern Greenland. And I hope those experiences uh, are, are quite relevant. I'm sure they're quite relevant. Um, when I think about the science drivers, I can speak for hours about reasons to map the seafloor and all kinds of for all kinds of different uh, purposes. But I think we've heard already today wonderfully from Natalia, from Ted, from Adrian, um, 
the compelling, compelling reasons that we need to map to seafloor. And that's indeed to understand the pathways of the uh, circumpolar deep water and how heat is transferred uh, and transported onto the shelf and into the ice cavities. And that's really what we need to do much better prediction of uh, global sea level rise. And we look at uh, the area of uh, Wolf's Land there, virtually unmapped, but only the dark green lines are existing mapping data. And that's an area, as has been pointed out before, of a potential 12 meter uh, sea level rise uh, capacity. And so we, we have a, a compelling problem and it implies that we need to map and we know where we're working. So it needs, we need to have a mapping system on an icebreaker and a multi-beam system to give us a, a complete map. We have lots of icebreakers around that have uh, multi-beam sonars on them. We're very lucky about that globally. If we look at the US fleet, it's a little smaller. And of course, by time we see the Palmer uh, out of service and even the Healy, we're stuck with whatever you guys come up with. So it's very, very important. When we think about uh, multi-beam sonars and icebreakers, we have to be uh, very careful. It's not the standard multi-beam sonar. Most multi-beam sonars are put on a uh, gondola beneath the hull. You cannot do that when, on an icebreaker. So if we look at icebreakers, and this is the Odin, the uh, multi-beam sonar has to be flush with the hull, which is uh, difficult to do, often behind the nice knife. And after that, it has to be reinforced with titanium rods and all kinds of special coatings. Um, and even at that, it, it, uh, takes, it takes a beating. So we have to think about the special aspects of multi-beam sonars on icebreakers. Um, but an icebreaker is just a single platform and we need to be able to expand that footprint. We have large scale mapping we do. The entire area of Wilkes Land needs to be mapped and we're not gonna do that in our lifetime from a single icebreaker. And so we need to expand the footprint and we're making lots of progress now with uh, small autonomous surface systems that can carry mapping sonars on them, um, that can work at high speed, that have uh, very good sea keeping, keep, uh, keeping capabilities. They can be deployed from the vessel um, if we have that capability to deploy them. And we're also making progress with uh, autonomous sailing vessels that can have much longer duration. The sail drone uh, surveyor up there, we launched from San Francisco spent uh, 30, 40 days up in the Aleutians and came back to San Francisco. So we have this possibility for uh, long range missions and we have to keep track of course of where those, are, those areas are gonna be ice free at particular times because these vessels will not be able to break through the ice. They'll have to avoid the ice. We're making tremendous progress along these lines. The duration, the vehicle I showed you there had a five to seven day duration. We're looking at the next generation with 30 to 40 day endurances for some of these vessels and ranges like 2,500, 30, uh, 3,000 nautical miles. And so we're making progress as we look to the years ahead with these uh, force multipliers of autonomous surface vehicles. And the beauty of the surface vehicle is it's constantly in touch with the satellite system. We can use low earth orbiting satellites and have full situational awareness. We can actually operate these often from the shore. But as uh, Brittany talked about, um, we really need to get under the ice um, for a lot of the areas that are of interest. Um, we've had, as Brittany said, uh, auto sub has gone 100 kilometers or so uh, under the ice. Um, years and years ago, a Canadian company built the AS, uh, AUV called Theseus, made a 200 mile mission under the ice and back. So 400 miles uh, back and forth. Um, but this indeed, as we look to the, to the future, is gonna be the real challenge to have the power, the positioning, the communication, situational awareness, truly autonomous sensors that let us operate under the ice. And I think Brittany uh, addressed uh, some of that progress there very, very nicely. Um, aside from the broad scale mapping, again, as was pointed out by Adrian and others, we have all the issues of understanding the processes at the ice margin and under the ice. And this is a much finer scale mapping uh, issue. And there again, we need to deliver our mapping sonars under the ice. But here we will have, uh, as um, uh, I think Natalia pointed out this morning, uh, looking at the geology and the sub-bottom uh, processes to understand the history. Uh, how can we get there? We've made some progress. Alan Mix and I, uh, working with Swedish colleagues, uh, again in Northern Greenland, shown the power, I think, of mapping and high resolution. In uh, this case, uh, Peterman Fjord, be able, being able to look at the history of grounding wedges as they've retreated, understanding the history of ice movement in response to environmental conditions, but also understanding in great detail the flow conditions. Here we were in Peterman Fjord, again, able to reconstruct the history, uh, recent history of the ice movements, uh, comparing that to uh, Sherrod Osborne Fjord or where Ryder Glacier is, 
where the history of the ice sheet has been quite, quite different. The, particularly the floating ice tongue of Peterman uh, has fallen back tremendously in the last several thousand years, while in uh, Sherrod Osmond Fjord, the ice tongue has actually grown or stayed stable. And why is that difference? Well, when we look closely at the bathymetry, we see that in one, there was a deep passage that allowed warm Atlantic water in to directly touch the ice sheet in uh, Ryder or Sherrod Osmond Fjord, there was a second sill that prevented that. And so again, the important power of seeing that, that fine scale bathymetry for understanding the processes and what's going on at the ice margin. At the same time, our sonars can look at the water column too. And with a multi-beam sonar up in the upper left there, we can actually see melt plumes coming up along the ice face, but we can get even closer and higher resolution with broadband sonars, sonars that were developed for fisheries that we've now adopted physical oceanography where we can see processes like thermal healing staircases. We can look at the mixed layer, the distribution of the mixed layer near the ice front, and even seeing, again, freshwater, freshwater plumes coming out. So we have this capability with the sensors to see what's going on at the ice front um, very, very nicely. And the problem is it's dangerous to work there. We're not going to send crude vessels right at the ice front. So we're working on a generation of now small autonomous platforms, surface platforms, that let us get right to that ice front get high resolution sonar images with LIDAR, uh, with LIDAR above the, uh, uh, the surf sea surface and with high resolution sonar looking at the uh, ice front, looking at ice cavities. Uh, and again, with the, the broadband acoustic sensors on them, being able to look at the melt processes at the same time. Here, again, this is touching on what Brittany talked about. We really need to get under the ice sheet though, in a Greenland perspe perspective, 40 to 50 kilometers in an Antarctic perspective, a thousand kilometers. And so this is really where we have to start pushing hybrid vehicles, ROVs slash AUVs that can really allow us to move under the ice. And also, as we've heard time and time again, some all have long-term year round presence there, which is gonna be key. And so I end up with what I really think the future may be. We're seeing an evolution of autonomous systems that can have remarkable ranges. We'll see four or 5,000 kilometer range on these vehicles, but these vehicles can in themselves be then a platform for either an autonomous system or a hybrid system. They can launch them. And again, within a, the 40 year framework we were asked to look at, I think this will be quite feasible. The challenges of course, are gonna be again, the bottleneck of communication, being served by low, uh, low earth orbiting satellites is going to help us tremendously, but the acoustic communication through the water column too. But again, I think in the 40 year framework we're talking about, we're going to make tremendous progress there. And so to end up, I think the bottom line is we have the senses and we know what to do with them, at least from an acoustic perspective. The key, as Oscar said, and many other people said, is going to be access. We need access to the broad region, to the ice margin and under the ice, and we need year round presence. And in my mind, even though I was supposed to talk about mapping, it's really the platforms and the delivery systems that are going to be the key. And I think there's going to be tremendous, uh, a tremendous future in broadband, uh, in, excuse me, in uh, uncrewed platforms. They offer us greater flexibility, safety, as long as we can overcome the problems of broadband communications, power, positioning, and situational awareness. We have time to do that, and I think we will. Thank you. Do that. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much, uh, Larry, and to all of the speakers. We are right on time, and we have about 25 minutes for questions. Um, we can do both virtual and in person, and participants can input their questions into Slido, or if you're in the room, you can come to either of the microphones and ask your question. Um, and if you're participating remotely, you can also raise your hand and wait to be called upon. So, all right, we'll start with a few Zoom questions. Okay. Um, first one is for Oscar. What features need to be included in the ship design to facilitate to facilitate future tech that you described? Um, a lot of the vehicles um, that I work with are on the smaller side. So having small boats that can easily be deployed, that's going to be the same thing that's going to enable things like looking at whales and animals. So that needs to be facilitated. Um, there are smart sort of platforms you can put on the side of ships or, you know, on the back A-frame for capturing vehicles of different sizes and different values. Um, and so, 
you know, if you have a Ferrari, you're going to need a different system on the back A frame to pick it up as opposed to a glider, which is like a Yugo. Yeah, where it's not worth that much relative to everything else. So I think flexibility is the key. Um, but it's not like it used to be in terms of it, if you can do the stuff you were talking about, you can handle most of the vehicles easily. Thank you. Um, all right, for Matt, can you comment on how the ARV and or existing vessels could support a seafloor geodesy network? Yeah, great question. Um, so there are a couple different ways to do seafloor geodesy right now. You have things like GNSS acoustics, uh, where typically you bring a ship back to survey it in, but you can do that with gliders. So a ship that's capable of sending out fleets of gliders to go survey in all of these monuments you put on the seafloor. You can do it with just pure pressure sensors at this point. And so, you know, we're talking about deploying relatively small instruments off the side. So if you can throw giant floor drills uh, to the seafloor, you can put a little, you know, sonar buoy uh, on the seafloor. I'm just really glad that I explained it a little more in advance to you. <laughs> Uh, Larry, can multi-beam systems on icebreakers with the inherent design limitations of the hull reach the same resolution or other capabilities of MB systems on other ships? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, there, there is no single type of multi-beam system. Everything scales with frequency. The higher the frequency, the higher the resolution, but the less the range. And so the decisions that have to be made, and there have been discussions with the other um, committees that are that are looking at at, at uh, at uh, the equipment on the vessel is, do you go with the lowest frequency systems, which are full depth range with the lowest resolution, um, or try to scale up and you try to find that sweet spot. You can increase the resolution of a multi beam system by increasing the ray, the ray length. And so the beauty of an icebreaker is that you have a lot of uh, space on it. So you actually can get from a lateral resolution perspective, a relatively high resolution multi beam sonar on deep water multi-beam sonar on, on an icebreaker. And so it, it's the same as any other vessel. Our, our near shore surface vessels have, have, have very high resolution sonars that only work in a few hundred meters or less. Um, midwater sonars work in uh, midwater depths. Um, and for something like the icebreaker, we'd expect a, a full ocean depth sonar that will have a very capable resolution and potentially a second high, very high resolution sonar as it gets into the shallow water. And the trick is finding the proper overlap of frequencies in the sweet spot. So we maintain the best possible wherever we are. There's always gonna be a small compromise with an icebreaker because the ice windows that are necessary do uh, limit somewhat how, how uh, far out and they add to the attenuation. So how far out the swath will be. But for the most part, the physics is the same. And um, there's been lots of thought about trying to get that sweet spot between a full ocean depth system and a second high resolution system. So when you're in the shallower waters, you can get that full, really high resolution and still get maintain coverage and cost effective mapping elsewhere. Thank you. Uh, next question is for Brittany. These high, for these high basal melt rates about 20 meters per year, is there a way to know if these are persistent over long time scales, i.e. month to year? Um, what is the capacity for ice fin to make persistent observations near the grounding zones? Yes, so those are good questions. So um, I should note, so there's a, like, so there's two papers coming out. One's from uh, mooring data, uh, as well as um, perspectives kind of in the open ocean. And so it's a grounding line mooring or very near the grounding line and then uh, further out on the glacier tongue for Thwaites. And so um, I guess there's there's two ways to answer this. One is that you know the, the vehicles give you the spatial scales that we are unable to get otherwise. Um, the long-term, so far moorings mostly, but also other types of deployable um, sensors are the, really the answer for these longer term rates. Um, and this is only for one particular part of the system. So the important parts to think about is, is the the takeaway is that you can see the difference in these two relatively similar types of environments between one thermal regime and the other. And so having multiple to compare 
um, tells you what's really in all of these systems, rather than assuming that we're all talking about one flat base, ocean comes in this way, goes back out this way, when really it's going along the coast and, and there's these dynamic interactions. And so that says that there is a spatial aspect to problems that we don't always think about because we've been limiting ourselves to one and two dimensional uh, measuring techniques. So that's a sales pitch, I guess. Um, in terms of what the vehicles can do, we are currently limited by the fact that we have to pull out of the water to recharge and go back down. Um, and so the ROV approach is limited by battery length and the ability to recharge, but that doesn't have to be. So anything you're putting through the ice, as long as you think about its dimension and what your access is gonna be, um, that can be mitigated. So things like deployable, um, either wired or wireless charging uh, platforms. There's things that we've now proposed multiple times to technology programs and not yet been funded, but will happen. Those technologies exist for open ocean platforms. They've enabled a lot of the surface um, resources that have been mentioned here. And so those kinds of things can be deployed under the ice. They're a little bit different. Um, but the other thing I forgot to maybe mention is that as we, and I think it was really importantly mentioned in this last one is that it's access to everything. And so for grounding zones, which is this marginal environment that we know very, very little about, um, we really do need to go through the ice and get as close as possible. And so your tether length is what's limiting you there. In terms of amount of observations or the, the duration of those observations, you'd really like to make those seasonal. Um, that may not always be possible. So small vehicles can also deploy sensors. And so we're trying to work on the kinds of sensors that we could send out. But back to this need for communication, if you were to melt through, do all of your experiments, but as a part of your mooring, leave behind an acoustic comm system that you could communicate to deployed sensors, that would give you your, your change in time at a specific location rather than just the access point, which I think is really the frontier for that. And the other part I wanted to mention too is that the sea ice, the nice thing about the small vehicles like this is that we can use the sea ice as a platform. And so if we have the ability from an icebreaker to go out onto the sea ice and get into a marginal zone, that would actually help us because we can then core through 10 inches or meters and meters and meters of ice, you know, just put in a small hole to access and get under and still do that high spatial resolution work. So there's a lot of thinking about AUVs and their, their longevity, um, parking them under ice shelves for a long period of time. I'm not sure you wanna park a platform that's that valuable for that long. They can certainly be able to do it, but how do you recover that? And then your emergency plan for vehicle safety becomes a real issue. So the robustness of those platforms might be really, it's this fusion of deployability and then, and then using it to get these high resolution spatial pictures of, of processes that we can't resolve otherwise. Thank you very much. A question for Chris. Could the UAVs communicate with and collect data from instruments deployed on the seafloor? Uh, it's a good question. Um, you would need to have some surface expression probably to have this telemeter the data back or, um, yeah, but we need to have, we need to have some surface expression. Okay. Yeah. Or you have some autonomous vehicle that is underwater and comes up to the surface, like okay. a, an Argo float or, yeah. Did we get to all the Slido ones? Uh, there's still more, but if okay. you want to jump in, please. Well, I do. I have a question. Um, it's more of a philosophical question. Um, I don't know who's online, but um, I was struck this morning by the comment of how to get input to the National Science Foundation outside of this report, if you're in the community, um, if you would like to see certain capabilities added to the ARV or other needs addressed. And I can't remember who said it, but someone spoke to the fact that um, there was a subcommittee or committee in place and their email addresses are on the website. And I just have to say, after 18 years in the federal government and being back in academia, I'm so tired of people pushing me to websites to find email addresses of people that I have to write 18 page emails to to appeal to them to get a requirement on the table. I'm not saying that's the wrong way to do it, but I wonder if we could think about or what the panelists think about as far as 
pathways to get your input as far as requirements to federal or other agencies, international partners for some of these requirements outside of the academies. The reason I bring that up is I feel like we need more workshops and less conferences. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I just, I welcome any thoughts on that. I'm not sure how to capture that as a requirement in our report for an open dialogue. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Because I, I, I think that, you know, you come to a National Academy meeting like this, there's lots of smart people, you start thinking about things you hadn't before. And too rarely we go back to our lives and can't capitalize on it. And, right. You know, given the post pandemic world, with a lot of this virtual stuff, figuring out new models for collecting the information, I think would be awesome. And I feel like people think the burden, it's like booking your own travel. It's like all the burdens on you to go and figure out all the research. It's its becoming that way, you know. And we have um, somebody at the mic. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I'll just speak up because I am um, the chair of the SISC, the, the committee that is working with NSF and with the design team to try to incorporate all of the community input. So, um, my name is the one that's on the <laughs> here and big, many of the people who are um, speaking today, but I really am here to listen. I have taken a lot of notes. I have lots of information and please, you know, feel free to contact me, to come talk with me. I'm here at all the meals and I just want to hear everything that you have to say. I also have lots of information that if you don't want to dig through the website, I can tell you there are so many documents that on our committee, sometimes we're asking each other questions and the information's all there, but it's a lot of, it's a lot of paperwork to go through. Mm -hmm. um, but if people want to know, you know, what are the different, you know, winches, wires, A-frames, what kind of small boats uh, do we have in mind? Please come talk to me. I can show them to you. I can take notes and get that information back. And then also to remember, as I think Tim pointed out, we're still really at the beginning. I mean, when he said preliminary, he really means preliminary. You know, I already, you know, have notes from Mo. Oh, I think we have the wrong number there because I saw that the, I just looked it up. It's 40,000, it should be 60,000 pounds, right? So that's the kind of information that we need. And I'm sorry that if it hasn't been as easy to get all this stuff on. No, yeah, I, I, I wish it was, but anyhow, here I am. So please talk. No, I great. I greatly appreciate that you came forward. I also don't think it's practical for everybody in the room to come talk to you for because of your time, right? I mean, you can't uh, do that kind of lift and have your day job. So I wonder sometimes how we best push information out rather than have to go pull it to ourselves. Um, and it's not just the ARV. I find that on there are many other. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm so glad that Amy, yeah. Amy got up and, and, and introduced herself because I have to admit as an outsider to the whole process, but somebody who's spoken to both committees, I'm quite confused. Um, and, and, and I'm hoping that there's a mechanism that really rationalizes this. And, and the biggest danger is what, what you brought up early this morning is that you, you, when you build a, something like an ARV, it, it, it's it's a giant ball that starts rolling. And at some point there are things that are immutable. Uh, you know, things get fixed. And if that happens too early on without that input, yeah. we can end up with a product at the end of the day that that really is less than, less than uh, the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you, Larry. And thank you for coming forward and saying that, appreciate it. Uh, sorry, I'm sure we have other questions in the Slido as well. Uh, a question for Larry. Could water column under ice shelves be monitored acoustically by long-term deployments of multi-beams on the ice surface or via boreholes, as you showed with the ship-mounted multi-beams? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, abs absolutely. It, and it's, it, it always boils down to the same thing. It's, it's a question of access and power. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I don't know if I should. It, it, I, I, I've been wondering what's what, you know the power problem is quite solvable. Um, we we just as a as a nation drifted away from from small nuclear reactors long ago, but um, our, our competitors are now instrumenting their seafloor instruments this way, and and I think we need to take a another look at that as as a you know hopefully a very safe um, 
but potential source of, of very, very long-term uh, power for some of our instruments. So I think it could be a real game changer. Thank you. A uh, question for Brittany. Does IceFin have water sampling capability? <laughs> Uh, yeah, great question. Um, yeah, so Icefin has hopefully, uh, and vehicles like that, the idea behind how it's developed is to allow the scientists to drive literally the boat, uh, or the sub in this particular case. Um, and so the the science bay that the image I showed had a, had a mapping sonar in it. Um, that can all be swapped. And so we have a water sampler. Um, we haven't deployed it deep under ice yet because it takes space on the vehicle. And so it really depends on what the science drivers are. Um, so we've de deployed it under sea ice and under the front part of the McMurdo ice shelf. Um, we've done, uh, we have a paper in the works on a, a microbial imager, uh, a holographic microscope um, that we've developed. So a whole bunch of different flexible uses for those science packages. So. Um, it's hard with very small vehicles to gather enough water samples, but they're at least able to be targeted. So this one um, has six um, like hundred mil capabilities. So um, it'd be nice to do nice to do more. Um, but uh, the through going through the ice is the is the biggest limiter for that vehicle. Thank you. Uh, question for Matt. Regarding the fiber instrument instrumented network, would there be any synergies with the proposed McMurdo New Zealand subsea telecom science cable that is looking at concepts for smart repeaters, distribute, distributed fiber sensing and branching units for future science cable extensions? Yes. I mean, it, it's all part of the same backbone. I mean, we're using telecommunications uh, uh, cables across the oceans right now to do to listen to whales. Uh, we can do this, we know we can do this. And so I'm imagining a network that basically ties into a subsea mm -hmm. uh, data transmission cable. And then these, you can put, you know, anchors on this for uh, autonomous vehicles too. On, and then they communicate their data. They go back home to their little base station, they communicate the data out. And so it's a, a multi-use network. We, the entire world is covered in fiber at this point. It crisscrosses the globe, except in Antarctica. Thank you. Uh, quite... <laughs> <laughs> and on ice pen. <laughs> and and there are ROVs that lay cables. That's how telecoms do it. So sometimes. But that's that that teeth you. Tethius vessel um, AUV that I showed you. Its purpose was to lay a cable on, under the under the Arctic ice. Uh, for Mo, how long is the um, umbilicus on Mebo? Um, the Mebo two hundred umbilicus, I believe, is around two thousand meters. Uh, with most of, most of these things, it's sort of there's what comes off the shelf, and then you can work with the designers to change that. Um, I think up to like 2,500 or 2,700 meters would be desirable, and I believe that's possible with that system. Thank you. Um, from experience, we know that autonomous vehicles in polar ice environments often need rescuing. What resources are needed on the ship, small boats, helos, others? that could allow the ship to focus on ship work and not spend too much time on rescuing uh, autonomous vehicles. And this is an open question, so <laughs> whoever would like to jump in. Uh, uh, Brittany's, probably, <laughs> Brittany's probably more expert, but, but I'll, make a, I'll make a comment. You know, we were asked to look at a 40 year window and we're in such an early day with autonomous vehicles that there are unquestionably issues of reliability. And, and I think, you know, as we start thinking about this longer and longer window, we hopefully will increase the reliability tremendously, will increase a number of the capabilities, particularly communication and, and things like that. And so it, there's no question that, that the kind of things we talked about are not necessarily realistic right now, but, but we have to take a look at that window. And Brittany, you, you, you have more experience than I have. <laughs> no worries. I mean, and we have we don't have any, for, or I don't personally have any for doing, you know, open ocean recoveries, but all the really like record breaking under ice under ice robotics is done under sea ice because it can be res it can be rescued easily, right? So we you can drive across and cut a hole as I mentioned. So the ability to operate from the sea ice 
or operate, get out to the site is, is pretty easy. And that doesn't need the entire vessel to go do it. Um, I also mentioned this idea of, of acoustic networks or ways of communicating with the vehicles. Um, and that's really what's needed is things like USBLs or beacons that you can you can put out because then it's like a breadcrumbs to get back to where to where the vehicle knows where it is because that's actually the that's actually the issue. So um, most people are used to you know their cell phone and their constant GPS access. Now put it underwater and now put a lid on top of it and have the entire geometry train. You know we have autonomous cars that can't park in a place with constant right constant conditions like being monitored and positioning information. And that's what we're dealing with is it's a really challenging environment to operate. And so anything we can do to help with awareness um, or at least, hey, come home, here's safety is really the biggest thing. So um, I think there's two sides of it. One is access and the other side is just building up some communications framework. Um, and the other thing is expectations build for robust conditions, think about what the operations are going to be like. Sea ice is not ice shelf ice. Um, and so those types of things just need to be considered as part of the mission ops um, as well. So we think a lot about the technology and the people being separate. That's something else I didn't get a chance to mention is that, you know, the technology doesn't get rid of people in the field. There will be people in the field. It just allows you to do dead different and more things with it. I hear a lot of people talk about, well, one day just the, the thing will go do it and then we'll be sitting on the side. It's true from a certain perspective, but there's still technologists, there's still scientists in the loop, and there's still these parts of the operations that that we're very, very good at and that our and our ability to react in the moment is very useful. And so those things just have to be thought about um, from a mission design perspective um, from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And if we if we think about the the, the losses we've seen of AVs under the ice and the way the few that have been recovered have been recovered, it's been with an ROV. And so I, I think if, if you think about a, a, a kit that you'd have on board, you'd have the, the AUVs, but you'd have a, it could even be a very small but hybrid uh, ROV that can then on a fiber go out and actually locate the, uh, the AUV again. And your idea of acoustic sensors around it for positioning is great. But could actually attach something to it if necessary. So I think there are ways to approach it. But let's let's hope we get yeah, to those yeah. liability. I think there's also like for open ocean where there might be distance involved. It's about building behaviors into the robots where I'm going to go into panic mode and I'm going to go in conservation and then my battery storage could be two years, you know. Um, and so there's this and the other way I think when we move to these new technologies which give us a whole new way of doing things is you have to think about the dollar per data byte. Yep. And so if a glider goes out and gives you 20,000 CTD profiles, you know, and you compare that to the cost of doing a single ship CTD profile, you know, it's a different way you scale the problem if you're talking about science outputs. Yeah, I think that's completely true. You mentioned the the vehicle, the algorithm is part of it, right? Um, the biggest problem is that right now most things just surface, right? They're, that's the, the default. And so you, surfacing can't be the answer. So we lose things under the ice because they don't know where they are. And so if we can get a way to, to talk to them um, or at least to, to help let them know where they are and where to come to, then that's really the, that's really the answer. All right, I think we're at our time. Let's thank our speakers for this afternoon. Okay, thank you speakers. Um, so stay with me for one more minute. We're gonna take a break in just a moment, um, but we just wanna set up the structure of the afternoon breakout sessions. Um, before we go to break, we're just gonna have a look at the slide that shows you the organization of the breakouts this afternoon. We're going to be using um, sort of a workshop prioritization approach called the KJ technique. And some of you may have used this in breakout sessions before. It's actually rather clever. Um, it uses sticky notes that are both virtual and physical to identify group priorities um, before there's discussion about the priorities. So we'll spend the first 30 minutes in each session 
brainstorming or organizing our ideas as individuals. And then the second 30 to 40 minutes, clustering those ideas into priorities and then discussing those priorities and whether anything was left out. Now, you may have noticed this morning, we talked about solid earth and we talked about sea level and we spoke about science and we spoke about capabilities. And those will be the focal points of the breakout sessions as well. So first, uh, please decide if you'd like to participate in a breakout room uh, session on solid earth, which is related to the first session from today, or if you'd like to participate in one on sea level rise, which was related to our second session today. Once you've identified the session you're interested in, please go to the room listed here that corresponds to that thematic area, and please do it by the first letter of your last name. So in other words, um, A through M under solid earth would go to room 118, whereas um, N through Z would go to room 120, okay? And if you find you go to a room and it's super full, uh, virtually or physically, and you want to switch, that's okay. So um, if you, uh, sorry, if you're a moderator, facilitator, or rapporteur, you should report to your assigned room, which is shown here. A reminder that the rapporteur will be reporting back at the end of today's session, their interpretation of the discussion to the full group when we come back in main session. So please take notes and prioritize or highlight as best as you can. And please, everybody, report to your room by 3 o'clock and then come back to the auditorium to report findings by 4.30. And I'm happy to answer any questions if that's not clear to people. Is that clear? Everybody just wants to get to coffee. I get it. Okay. All right. Let's break for 15 minutes and we'll get to our rooms by 3 o'clock. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to resurrect us. Um, first, I just want to take one minute and acknowledge not just the hard work of the committee members, especially Alan, the co-chair, but all of the academy staff who literally have done a Herculean lift in a matter of months, scripted us to the nines this week, have done a beautiful job pulling together expert speakers. You guys have done a fabulous job today. Um, and just literally have kept us completely on track. So thank you, everybody. Okay, now comes the fun part, as if the rest wasn't fun already. We will now hear from the rooms, each room's rapporteur. Rapporteurs, please, if you're in the room um, or virtually, come sit on the stage here up at the table. I want to remind everybody that the report back presentations are not necessarily the personal ideas of the rapporteur nor the committee, but rather the collective ideas from the individual breakout groups. And I understand some went very smoothly, some are a little bit more hairy, so bear with everybody as we craft the message. Um, so if um, the folks from room 118 are here, let me see. I'm gonna check for a second who that was. Was it solid earth? So so my understanding is solid earth did all the virtual and in-person together in one general session. Yes. Okay. And who is the report out? Okay. Come on up. Lucky winner. <laughs> So uh, I get the time for all three groups. Yes, you do. All right. Great. Executive and I, decision. <laughs> and I did try to pass this off onto someone else, but I, I lost. Okay. Okay. So uh, all three of the Solid Earth groups met together, and so, and as a result of our Padlet exercise, we identified uh, the following items as our major science drivers. Uh, so our group is interested in studying the heat flux and heat flow beneath Antarctica and around the Antarctic margin. So that includes the study of volcanism, uh, crustal geology, um, major tectonic boundaries and how they might conduct heat up to the surface and how heat flow impacts the base of the Antarctic ice sheet. We're interested in the role of tectonic boundaries 
and faulting on ice sheet processes and routing groundwater. Our group is interested in mapping the Earth's structure, which includes its layers, its rheology, mantle viscosity, which impacts uh, glacial isostatic rebound rates, and understanding the geodynamo. Okay, so the icebreaker capabilities needed to achieve those science goals include multi-beam mapping, and there we're interested in looking at seafloor geomorphology, uh, past records of ice sheet interaction with the seabed, uh, for ice, past ice sheet thicknesses, uh, for mapping the surface expressions of tectonic boundaries, uh, and also for selection of coring targets. Uh, we need a variety of over-the-side capabilities for sample collection, for deploying instrumentation, recovering instrumentation, uh, every all of the different things that you heard about in the talks this afternoon. Uh, coring and drilling are high priorities for past records of the Antarctic cryosphere, uh, which, as you heard from Mo, has impact on wire size, winch and A-frame capabilities. Um, underway geophysics are also high priorities for our group, and we're using this very broadly to include things like gravity, uh, magnetics, and sediment imaging while the ship is in motion, uh, seismic profiling using air guns, and recovering data from deployed instruments such as moorings and ocean bottom seismometers. Okay. All right, and then uh, we figure that ice breaking is a given, so we put that off in a separate category, but we'd like to reinforce that ice breaking is just a really critical capability to access challenging heavy sea ice areas. Okay. Great, thank you. Nice job pulling together multiple sessions. That was great. Okay. So uh, I think now we're gonna hear next from the session on sea level that met in the board boardroom, is that correct? Okay. And um, the rapporteur is Natalia Gomez, is that correct? Do I have that right? Okay. Oh, you can uh, come up together, okay. Sorry, thank you. Comic relief. <laughs> End of the day, comic relief. Oh, yeah, maybe. Oh, is it? Oh, fine. Okay. Uh, okay, so the main goal of this session was to focus on uh, knowing as soon as possible how much and how, how fast sea level will rise. And there was a discussion that a transdisciplinary approach is needed. And sometimes it was challenging to order one thing above the other because we really need both. Uh, so the science priorities uh, were ocean heat transport. There was some focus on circumpolar deep water here and the regions identified were the front of the ice shelf and ice shelf cavity, the continental shelf break and the grounding zone. And um, there was some debate about the order of the above three and the suggestion that we should consider them all as one, but they might need different uh, field uh, capabilities. Uh, the second priority was atmosphere ocean forcing. So both uh, the modern and current, um, and as well as the paleo, where the paleo included uh, centennial to millennial time scales um, and beyond, so past warm periods in the deeper time. Uh, which would come from ice, sediment, uh, rock cores, and then the recent long term, so uh, the 20th century especially, and sort of pre-satellite and pre-instrumental records. Uh, the second, the, the next one was the fate of meltwater. So how is this feeding back on circulation? Where is the water going? Uh, where will this meltwater be? What will it be influencing in 20 to 30 years from now? And then solid earth uplift. So both the, the question will uplift slow or halt the grinding line retreat uh, in the future and uh, the point that every measurement of mass balance on the Antarctic ice sheet uh, includes an, an estimate of uplift in GIA uh, that we currently um, don't know very well. Yeah, I'll hop in on the capabilities that we identified as priorities. So uh, first is the having multi-platform year-end access to sea ice, um, and then access to the adjacent continent for ice outcrop and subglacial records, the ever-present discussion of needing helicopter access. 
Um, next is uh, the capability to, to drill on the seafloor, including uh, the sort of beginnings of that process, which includes geophysical surveys for site selection. Um, uh, and then very clear uh, need for, for ROV and other autonomous systems support. Um, I think that captures much of what we discussed. And then we sort of had the broader point again here. Yeah, so at the end, we came back to the question of what do we really need more broadly to know how much and how fast. And for that, um, there is a need for not only more observations, but sustained uh, funding and support to be able to build the capacity to integrate all of these new observations with modeling and develop model capabilities to improve projections. Uh, and this sort of funding needs to be not attached to short-term grants that are dependent on getting a high impact paper out really quickly, but really um, extra support uh, that continues and is sustained on longer time scales. Like that's that it. Capture? Yeah. Thank you. So um, I have a thought that we don't have to address right now, but maybe after the next um, rapporteur report out, we could do it. I wonder to what extent, and this is not my field, um, the science priorities are the capabilities that are listed from each of the breakout groups um, actually address the science priorities that are listed. Do you see what I mean? Like, are we, if we, we were to give a comprehensive exam question to our graduate students and say, here's your science priority. What do you need observationally or whatever to address this? Would we have those covered? Yes, you have your... your... Right. 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 Yeah, I was thinking, well, why don't why don't we let the next rapporteur go? And I don't want to lose that point because I think a bad assumption for all of us, and I do it too, is to assume something's there, right? And not list it. Okay, sorry. Um, thank you to um, Natalia and Peter. Over to Earl Wilson, who was um, in the sea level session that met virtually, and they did a fabulous job. Earl? Uh, hello. Um, so I'll do my best to summarize the very lively discussion um, we had in our session. And so um, <clears throat> we have, uh, we organized our ideas into two separate themes, the science priorities and um, capabilities. And uh, much like the, the previous session, um, one theme that came, one sort of re resounding idea was the idea of how fast and how much. Um, and, 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 to, and that we thought wrapped up a lot of the ideas we have in mind. And so with regard to science priorities, um, we highlighted, um, broadly speaking, ice shelf um, ocean processes near the grounding zone as the, the most critical. And, and within that, um, we, there, there are questions that came up such as, um, you know, very basic questions such as, you know, what is the basal melting rates in these different regions? How do they vary over different time scales? How do they vary spatially? Um, what are um, potential stabilizing feedbacks um, for um, ice shelf retreat and so forth? Um, and the one thing that um, came up a lot is just the idea that, you know, there's so many unknown unknowns and, um, and there, there's a sense that, you know, there, just, there still needs to be a lot more observations before we can really ask like very pointed um, scientific questions. Um, and on the second point, um, ocean sea ice meltwater processes, um, this is really getting at um, the, the, the processes that bring warm circumpolar deep water to the shelf. And um, people um, highlighted um, um, mechanisms such as um, the potential feedbacks between pollinias and, um, and um, ocean heat loss, and that potentially setting up a feedback um, where um, CD double can stay on the shelf and, um, and, and contribute to melting long term. Um, 
And then the third point um, was about the fate of East, East Antarctica. Um, this is something we didn't get to discuss too much, but um, there was a sense that for longer term, for a longer term vision of our decades, um, we, we really need to think about how to expand our observational capabilities in this region. And so on the capability side, um, the, 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 the big theme that came out, rose on top, was the idea of um, just better logistics and access um, to these regions. And um, and on, on the on the topic of logistical support, um, um, people we've had several people highlighted um, the need for better international collaborations and um, how much of these collaborations are happening very on a very personal level, where individual PIs make ad hoc agreements with um, international partners, and so there was a sense that. Um, there needs to be higher level agency, agency level um, communication and, and collaborations to facilitate these international efforts. Um, there was a lively discussion about the about the use of um, helicopters and how best to leverage them. Um, on one hand, everyone acknowledged that helicopters can greatly expand our capabilities, our scientific capabilities on the ice. Um, a human on the ice can do a lot more than any um, drone or um, rover um, can accomplish. Um, but at the same time, um, there um, it was clear that these um, potential platforms are underutilized, at least on, on, on the U.S. side of things. And um, and one of the uh, things that we thought that needs to happen is that these helicopters, if they're if they're going to be utilized, they need to be readily available so that PS can plan around them and and design their science around their around them being there. Um, and also, um, um, there was this, there um, there was an identified need that we also need to take advantage of. Um, Icy moon, icy moon missions that are developing um, autonomous means of um, surveying the ice, and we can leverage that here on, 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 um, on, um, in Antarctica. Um, and, and lastly, there were a few things that kind of popped up that we didn't know how to um, just place, I mean, um, categories, categorically speaking, and one of them being uh, how to use models and how to use integrate models in, in both addressing scientific questions and also guiding observational um, work. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Earl. That was great. Um, so uh, I don't want to uh, co-chair push us to the last minute today just because we have extra time, but I have a question. I, I wonder if in the solid earth one, um, it came up any discussion about um, like ocean worlds, so to speak, and whether there was a conversation about the relationship of studying this planet for analogs on other planets or other heavenly bodies. Any discussion on that? Cross fertilization with that? Yes. Oh, oh yeah, because we have online people, forgive me. Sorry about that. Uh, there was one uh, very short uh, uh, talking about uh, how to utilize the uh, geophysical uh, infrastructure to detect the ocean water temperature change. In that area. Okay, but nothing about like uh, icy moons yeah, of other planets. About... Okay, mm -hmm. so, just okay. curious. I just am always trying to get communities to start thinking about working together in cross disciplinary fashion. Um, so I don't know if there's any other comments anybody felt compelled to make. What's really nice is in the science priorities and in the capabilities, I see some common threads which is great. Um, it's about integrating those and making sure they can they can be solid feedback to the academies and to, to NSF and to the committee, subcommittee looking at the ARV in particular. Any closing parting thoughts? Oh, somebody's waving in the back. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, I didn't bring any of what you just asked for about, about ocean okay. worlds up because I was at a meeting about Antarctica, but all of the vehicle stuff we showed was actually originally funded as development by NASA mm -hmm. um, through through its PSTAR program. So, um, and that's the a lot of that development as well. So it's definitely in all of this stuff. Okay, and not new. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Other comments, closing thoughts. Yes. Yeah, I think the ocean world is a very important uh, topic because probably we have like interdisciplinary uh, right now. Okay. So we can use that to talk about ocean world. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because I know a lot of uh, uh, some of the PR uh, investigators actually is using the Antarctic environment to test 
some uh, the, the the platform uh, fails for also. Okay. No, thank you for that. Any other parting thoughts, comments? All right. So um, thank you, everybody. I think that marks the end of our first day of our workshop. A reminder to the um, invited speakers and committee members to join us for dinner at six o'clock. Please plan on arriving at the building between 9.15 and 9.30 tomorrow morning as we'll start promptly at 9.45. And thank you, everybody. Wonderful first day. <laughs>